Hello, hi, hi. It's your boys. Mm -hmm. This is how we're doing. You're, you're this, is the, the, this is the strong this is, opening. This you is the today. strongest opening we have. Yeah. We, we had three uh, and openings that we threw away, and this that is I was, the one that we ended. I up was with. satisfied yes. with, and Kaz was like, "Not good enough. We can do stronger. We can do better." It's your and this boys. Is it. <laughs> this is uh, it. This uh, is it's Kaz here, along with Jameson. Hey. Uh, and this isn't usually how we start episodes, but this is kind of a, a bit of a different episode. Uh, because, um, as has happened on the past on this show, uh, we experienced some slight technical difficulties while we were recording this episode, mm -hmm. uh, this episode that you were listening to on the movie Stay, and, uh, when we got- What a terrible movie for all this to happen to, anyways, what right? A, what like, an absolutely terrible title. Yeah. It's just like a not- it, it's not a good title, it doesn't stick if it in anything, the memory, this it's just like a- yeah. This movie has now overstayed its welcome. Oh, boy. Yeah. You know what? Scrap. No, scrap no, it. we can't. Scrap we it. We're starting again from the beginning. It's your boys. Hey. Um. So basically, what happened is we recorded about thirty minutes of the episode, and then we, when we checked back on the recording, we noticed that Audacity had had some sort of hiccup. Uh, we're not really sure. Well, we have some theories as to why it happened, but basically, um, there were all these holes in the episode, and uh, we we lost about. 20% of the episode? Not even that, really. Like, Well, not even, like, the whole episode. Just, yeah. like, the, the first leg of our episode. So I want to say, like, we were recording for about 30-ish minutes, and we lost about 10% of that at various drop-off points. Yes, it was sporadic, is the thing. We would be in the middle of a conversation, and then the audio would cut out, and then it would, it would come back two to three minutes later. Yeah. Um, long after, after we, like, moved on and yes, long, on various tangents. Absolutely. As, as we do. Um, so there wasn't really any good way for us to go back and re-record that audio. So what we're going to do instead... This is a bit of a... Of a, of a podcaster's commentary episode. Mm. We're going to, we're going to interject, uh, at a certain point in the episode. Uh, that will be when, when the audio drops out, mm. you'll suddenly hear uh, our voices and we're going to try and fill you in like a, on like a developer's commentary as, <laughs> as best as we can on uh -huh. what we were talking about. Uh, we're also giving a little space, uh, to our guest, Mark Dosla, who, really saved this episode. In more ways than one. Yeah, <laughs> because he just so happened to have um, a bunch of um, computer equipment with... He just brought his own podcast recording studio with him yeah. to my apartment. Yeah, he, he, he's and, probably like, oh, so where do I meet you guys? Oh yeah, you, you meet me at my apartment. He's like, really? Okay, you know what? <laughs> Let's... <laughs> on the off chance that you guys are a bunch of bullshit amateurs at this sort of thing. Maybe I'll bring my really effective laptop and my high-quality microphone. Look, if it was anyone other than Mark Dosla, who's who's a great, dear person who I did a couple of shows with years ago, he's, he's a lovely guy. If it was anyone other than him, I would be just so embarrassed that this played out the way he does, the way it did. But, but Mark was the best of sports mm. and he he just rolled up his sleeve and said let's get this done let's let's get it going mm. and uh, you know this this is the result you're you're about to hear the result mm -hmm. of of what it was um but uh you know these things happen and we will strive to not make this the norm this it, it, it was it was in a blue moon kind of hiccup uh, just absolutely. listener be on the lookout and be aware that there will be uh various dips and um o like obvious audio quality. It'll be quite obvious. Mm, of knowing like when we were recording at Kaz's place, when we're recording this addendum piece, and when we stitch together the stuff that we're eventually going to get from Mark. Yes. Uh, we can assure you that the second portion of our episodes, the actual movie discussion, will sound a lot more uh, consistent. Oh, that sounds great. I've already listened to that. That's that's crisp and clean. Yeah. And oh, just you wait. Just you wait. You, you just gotta get you. through this. <laughs> All right, without further ado, let's uh, dive into uh, our episode on the movie Stay. Stay tuned. Don't Nothing is as it seems when a psychiatrist gets caught up in his patient's warped family history and apparent ability to bend the laws of time and space. We watch Stay, starring Ewan McGregor, today on Nothing Movies. self-identify and welcome back to nothing movies where we ask the question the fuck is this 
Or in the case of today's movie, the fuck is going on? Mm. <laughs> what is... This is, uh, yeah. It's the podcast where we uh, go through an actor's filmography and choose the most anonymous and culturally untalked about movies that they've made and decide whether they've got a certain something or if they're a whole lot of nothing or if they're somewhere in the middle, uh, trapped between life and death, but also they're... they're... Whoa, spoiler alert. Look, can we just... <laughs> Can we just put this on the table right now? Can we just talk about the spoiler? <laughs> just like, reveal in the it. first two minutes. I really think it's going to be impossible for us to discuss this movie let me if, put, we, if we don't say what this movie is let, about. Let, let me put it to you this way, uh, without revealing too much information, but I had this shower thought earlier today. You know the usual suspects, which is all about like Kevin Spacey recounting about what the events that happened before the interrogation starts, but then by the end of the movie it's revealed that he was just lying the entire time? That's kind of what's going on here. <laughs> like, what you just saw in this movie, eh, fuck it. Yes, fuck it by the end of it. Yeah, yeah, it really doesn't, yeah, it really couldn't matter. Couldn't mm. matter less. Yeah. Uh, I'm Cass Lesgard. And I'm Jameson Rafter. Uh, and the movie that's got us all befuddled today is... <laughs> got our <her> ire up. <laughs> uh, 2005 Stay. Uh, we're discussing this today because it is Guest Choice Month. Uh, there we go. It's like, you're to blame for you're, this. You're to blame for this. <laughs> and we're, and I know, and we're going to be releasing these over the course of more than just a month. But, you know, it's just like the name. I guess gotta go with the gaming campaign. In fact, I know for a fact we're gonna be releasing these over the course of March and April, so it's Guest Choice Months, technically, is what it is. It's on the book. That's pretty smooth that you there, Cass. It's on the book now. <laughs> Make the banner. Mm -hmm. And, uh, yes, and today, uh, well, what we are doing today is what we are doing for the, the remainder of these episodes until we get around to WrestleMania. Mm -hmm. uh, we are going to be inviting our guests to pick the actor whose career we are discussing. And today, our esteemed guest has chosen the career of one Ewan McGregor. So we are talking about a forgotten movie uh, that uh, he is the star of... Uh, and, uh, yeah, and speaking of that guest, let's, let's bring him in now. He's an actor. You've seen him on TV shows like Supernatural, I, Zombie, and So Help Me, Todd. Uh, it's Mark Doslaw. Woo! Hello, everybody. Happy to be here. But I'm also <laughs> kind of disappointed because on your previous episode, you promised that I would be invited in with a certain title of the space in which you work. Do you remember what that was? What now? Okay, I I more or less just flabbergasted that someone I've invited on the show has listened to a previous episode. Mm -hmm. That is very rare. Yeah, that yeah. has never happened. Explain yourself, Cas Lasker. I I don't. To answer your question, mm -hmm. Mark, no, I don't remember what I promised two weeks ago when we recorded our last episode. Mm -hmm. so all right. Well, I will explain myself, mm -hmm. future Jameson. Uh, what, what Mark was referring to here, this actually really, like, threw me th through a loop, because I, I truly did not remember what he was referring to, but what he was referring to was in the previous episode, where I invited Jameson into my boudoir. I specifically used the word boudoir. But by which he meant his actual apartment. He, yes. He refers to his apartment as the boudoir. Look, I don't... The whole of the apartment. I just want to give you a peek behind the curtain here. When I'm when I'm in front of this microphone here, I'm not thinking about the things that I'm saying. I'm just opening my mouth and shit comes out, you know? Uh, so I knew, like, boudoir was a word that people associate with living spaces uh that was that was enough and then after i said it i'm all like that's not what that word means that word that <laughs> word has like sensual connotations uh or whatever but and no then, and now you know yeah. and now listener you know and now you know the whole story and i was genuinely delighted that mark had listened to an actual <laughs> episode of the podcast that and, and he that was used, a nice surprise and he used that uh, and to, he used express, it, to express his disappointment and he used it against me <laughs> all right we are, in fact, in my boudoir. We are not in Podstream Studios. You do realize that boudoir it. means, like, bedroom, right? Yeah. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. And? All right. What exactly. Your, what's your larger point here? I don't know. Did you crash on the couch? It's like, did you Did you have a, a row with your cat and like he kicked night... you out of the bed? I mean, constantly. constantly. Yeah, yeah. I, I always wake up and he's in the center of the bed and I've, I've moved to the outskirts of it somewhere. Mm -hmm. I was always under the impression that, like, boudoir was, like, like larger than a bedroom, you know? Like there's like curtains involved, and, and like it can it can fit. It's a bedroom that can like easily fit like five or six people. Mm. I've never invite one person into my boudoir. <laughs> it has to be more than one. It's mm. an apartment in Vancouver. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> it's a basement apartment in Vancouver mm. uh, that's roughly the size of a of a, of a boudoir. Anyway, yeah. <laughs> Mark, welcome to the podcast, and yeah. welcome. 
to my boudoir. Thank I apologize. You. That's all I want. <laughs> I will never make that mistake again. No. Who are not. you, King Louis the Fourteenth? <laughs> Jesus Christ! <laughs> Thank you for listening to the show. And then we just, we got another one. Yeah, <laughs> we got another one. Uh, Let's so, treat our guests right, otherwise we'll never be back. <laughs> uh, well, our our guest is treating us right because we are we are using uh, Mark's equipment yeah. today. We are using his microphone because mine is still on the fritz. As I mentioned, we are not in Podstream Studios. We are in the... We, I, I guess We're in your boudoir. I guess this officially means this is the boudoir. Now, mm-hmm. we, we record at Podstream and we record at... The boudoir. TV. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Uh, wow, we really did uh, a lot of boudoir talk, uh, which which we're gonna stop now. We're not gonna. Mm. We can't. We can't continue that. Yeah, we, uh, we we're leaving yeah. it. We're yes. leaving it where it is. Uh, it's dead. Basically, we buried it. <laughs> <laughs> we don't want to make this in the, the first half of this longer than it already it needs mm. to be. Okay, so basically at this point, uh, I was I was just uh, ramping up to asking Mark why he chose you and McGregor, and basically what I said was I I gave him the the, the run of the podcast. I asked. I, I told him the, the concept or whatever. I said, pick an actor that you want to talk about. And then he said, uh, let me think about it for a second. And then he immediately came back and said, you and McGregor. So basically, this that's that's what happens in, in this chunk. Everybody got that? Everyone got that. These, these aren't all going to be entertaining. This is, this, is, <laughs> this is purely just like filling the gaps. Yeah, yeah. This is all the utility stuff. He said, ooh, give me a minute. And then even like less than a minute later, just all like, you know what? I don't need a minute. Ewan McGregor locked in. There we go. <laughs> all right. Uh, yeah. So explain yourself. Welcome. Welcome. <laughs> Number one, welcome. Number two, explain yourself. Okay. I mean, for one, <laughs> for one thing, um, he's a huge part of my childhood. You know, I grew up with the prequels. Say what you will. Mm-hmm. I was not a 10 year old being like, there are holes in this movie. And I was like, Star Wars. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And he's my Obi-Wan. And sure. So, mm-hmm. um, for that's one thing. I can but respect also, that. Like, Big Fish. I love <laughs> Big Fish as a kid. That's a really good movie. Mm-hmm. And pretty much everything that I've seen him in, I have loved. It doesn't matter. Oh, Moulin Rouge. That was my, like, mus- a, part of my yeah. musical awakening mm-hmm. as well, which was a big, big time for me. And um, that, that, that <laughs> dropped, like, right in the middle of the prequel trilogy as well, yeah. too. Like, we were still very familiar with him as Obi-Wan Kenobi at that time. And then, yeah. and then right in the middle of that, he's all like, check out what else I can do. I love it, love medley. I'm a song and dance man. That's how the lyrics to that go, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. But also just his life. Um, he's got, like, mm-hmm. the life that I think is the dream life. He's got, like, a collection of motorcycles... And he can do theater when he wants to do theater. He can do indie movies when he wants to do indie movies, big feature films. And for some reason, it seems like the the press kind of just, like, leaves him alone as well. So yeah, you just, never hear anything about Ewan <laughs> yeah. McGregor, really. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, if he's not making his, his motorcycle touring show uh, in Afghanistan, he's up to, like, three of those now. Yeah. Um, he does that a lot with his buddy Charlie Borman. Uh, yeah, I mean, like, yeah, yeah, I don't remember any, like, he certainly doesn't have any scandals, he seems like a... a Keeps his nose clean. uh, Perfectly nice, genial guy, Mm. he's been a teetotaler for about nine years, he said, because at the beginning of his career, he would show up uh, drunk and wasted on set, and then he just realized, oh, that's not sustainable, I gotta figure out how to do that. (laughs) Uh, you know, I mean, he's not, um, completely removed from tabloid gossip. Uh, last year, he got married to Mary Elizabeth Winstead. Yeah. Wow. I feel like not a lot of people talk about that. His, no. his Fargo season three co-star. Mm-hmm. Um, Good on you, Ewan. <laughs> but yeah, no, you're, you're, you're right, Mark. Ewan McGregor is an actor who pretty much can do any movie and, and make sense in any movie. He's got like these crazy blockbusters, but then he also has, for the purposes of our show, just a ton of nothing movies that, uh, you know, and, and that's, I should, I should explain for, for new listeners and just in general, every once in a while, I should probably explain, uh, the term nothing movie isn't always like a derogatory thing. It doesn't necessarily mean like this was rightfully forgotten because sometimes we, you know, we try and find like the hidden gems, mm-hmm. uh, amongst, uh, if it, it deserves new life somewhere. Yeah. Yeah. This is not one of those movies. Though. No, this this is uh, <laughs> this is firmly in the uh, latter category. Uh, yeah, but let's let's run through Ewan McGregor's career uh, super quickly. Uh, I mean, the other cool thing. So I believe the cool thing that I was about to mention is that uh, Ewan McGregor's real life uncle is the actor Dennis Lawson, who uh, played Wedge in the Star Wars movies. So he already had, and I don't, I think that was new information for you, wasn't it? It was, Jameson? Yeah. yeah. It was. I was familiar of the character of Wedge because he's like the only member of like that original trilogy who's not like the main core cast who survives all the way through yes. the rest of the trilogy. Yeah. 
Uh, yeah, but yeah, we were just talking about the neat little connection there, how uh, two actors in the same family both ended up uh, with notable parts in Star Wars, mm. uh, I believe is what we were talking about. Yeah, a, yeah. a series known about interconnected families. Indeed. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Plus thing about Obi-Wan, and he talks about the great reverence he had for Alec Guinness, and then he never once mentioned that his uncle was in the original trilogy. He maybe just... Uh, assumed it was common knowledge at that point. <laughs> yeah. he has, it's kind of one of those things, I've heard him mention it in multiple interviews now, mm-hmm. and I think he's kind of like, no, everyone's it, heard the story, sure, yeah. let's get something gotcha. new. <laughs> and he's worked with his uncle a bunch of times. His uncle has like directed him in plays on the West End and stuff, so, yeah, I mean, like de- the thing is, Dennis Lawson is like an actual, honest to God, you know, like, uh, uh, treading the boards British actor and everything, but everyone remembers from these little bit parts in, <laughs> in the first trilogy is all like, what character did you play? I, I play the, you know, he flies... You know, his, Luke's friend. You know, Luke's oh, friend. Oh, Han. He, no, no, no. The, 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 the other, other guy. guy. He flies C-3PO? Yeah. No, no. No. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, So, yeah, Ewan McGregor, he's got a bunch of credits here in British TV. Uh, His first movie is a Robin Williams drama called Being Human, Mm. uh, which uh, looks to have no cultural footprint. Possibly that's something we could do. Here's the other thing about when I'm trying to find the movies that we cover on Nothing Movies. There are a lot of movies that have absolutely no cultural footprint. I imagine we won't do... Episodes on all of them, because uh, a lot of them look uh, pretty depressing. (laughs) A lot of them are earnest dramas Mm -hmm. that, uh, as a comedy show, we can't really wring too many laughs out of. Uh, Mm -hmm. We've attempted it. Yeah. We've attempted a Maggie uh, here and there, and uh, it doesn't necessarily (laughs) Never going back to that well. Nope. Uh, But his early early breakout, uh, of course, and one of his uh, lasting... Uh, relationships, uh, working with a filmmaker. He's got his early uh, trilogy working with Danny Boyle. Uh, He's got Danny Boyle's first movie, 1994, Shallow Grave. Yeah, cut me off right after I said Shallow Grave, and I I still had two other movies to mention. Yes, the Danny Boyle trilogy is... Shallow Grave, followed by 1996's Train Spotting, yeah. which I feel like we talked a little bit about. I mean, that's like that's like one of his most famous movies, of course. Yeah, and we went into detail a little bit back when we were addressing Robert Carlyle in that 51st State. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and then the third movie that him and Danny Boyle made was A Life Less Ordinary, which is a very weird movie uh, where I believe he kidnaps uh, uh, Cameron Diaz, and then there are like a pair of angels on his trail like actual like guardian angels played by delroy lindo and holly hunter it's a very weird movie i i have been meaning to see it but uh that's the last movie that him and danny boyle made together um what i alluded to in the episode this is actually kind of good that we're going back because i actually forgot that to actually mention this what i alluded to in the episode was that him and danny boyle had this very um great partnership early on in their career and they he was kind of danny boyle's guy and then danny boyle's fourth movie was the beach with Leonardo DiCaprio, mm. and there was a huge falling out between Ewan McGregor and Danny Boyle because Danny Boyle basically promised Ewan the lead in the beach, and then when mm. uh, DiCaprio became available, he he got the role, and uh, they didn't work together until uh, Train Spotting Two, really, uh, decades later. So eventually they buried the hatchet, but I, uh, I suppose I mean you already worked with the guy so often, you know. Maybe he just wanted to break, well, wanted to explore other things. But, yeah, possibly, but I don't know. We weren't there. We weren't there in the room. Uh, we don't know uh, what happened. And then, yeah, basically here we just talked about the three Danny Boyle movies, uh, and then I mentioned a little movie called Brast Off, and Jameson couldn't quite believe the title of what I just said, uh, as you are about to hear right now. You mean Blasta? Oh no, no Brast. No, I mean Brasta. Uh. I I said what I said, and I meant mm, what I said. Gotcha. Uh, he's because he's got a trombone <laughs> on there. Uh, he has the very excellent and very gay film Velvet Goldmine, uh, where uh, I believe he uh, fucks Christian Bale up the ass. So if you ever <laughs> wanted to see Obi Wan Kenobi have sex with Batman, that that happened. Well, he's essentially he's essentially playing David Bowie in that movie, and everything but name. It's kind of. Uh, Velvet Goldmine is kind of the story of David Bowie mm-hmm. and Iggy Pop. They just changed the names 
Uh, but uh, they 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 kept the dick sucking. There's a lot of that. In what that a movie. name and what a subject matter to fit that name. Velvet Goldmine. Mm-hmm. Yes, indeed. Uh, yeah, he's in the British film Little Voice, which got nominated for some Oscars. I don't want to talk about that. 1999, of course. He's in Star Wars Episode One: The Phantom Menace, and mm-hmm. that's where everything changes. And that was the that was the movie that, mm-hmm. for better or ill, sort of changed the landscape of Hollywood forever and how we talk about sequels. Yeah, I mean, good on him for for being one of those early pioneering blue screen sets. You know, like Blue, blue Harvest. Mm-hmm. That was that Star Wars reference. Yeah, but I mean, like back in the, back then, they had to <laughs> act opposite of nothing. You know, there was nothing yeah. in that room. It was just a bunch of tennis blue ball. sheets everywhere yeah. and tennis balls, and he had to play there. believe. Yeah. He was wearing his his nylon or mm-hmm. whatever. He was walking around with like a big hat on and yeah, yeah saying things, you know. He was but like, I mean, but I mean, good for him for just having like the the gung ho ness of it and be like, oh sure, I could pretend that that's a huge dinosaur looking monster. Yeah, how much yeah. do you want to pay me? Yeah, yeah, how much? <laughs> I will. Yeah, I'll look at a tennis ball and I will just. I'll say your line, you George. Want to make it for that much money. <laughs> I, mean, I don't. I don't know if we've mentioned this yet, but uh, in that movie, he's playing Obi Wan Kenobi. Kind of a big deal. Mm. Kind of a kind of a, a central character. A, a young take on Obi Wan Kenobi, yes. which we hadn't seen that be- since before. I love how much <clears throat> Alec Guinness he drops into that performance, and how much Alec Guinness he's still dropping into that performance, and how much he's trying to base that performance on a performance given by another actor who it has been well documented hated every second of what yeah. he was doing. Mm. It just had nothing but, con- <laughs> nothing but contempt mm. yeah. uh, for, for two yeah. Yeah. Um, yes. did he Did he watch a bunch of early Alec Guinness movies for that role to kind of nail young Alec Guinness? I don't know. Let's ask him. You? What, are you, what, what would you say? I... <laughs> he's, a, he's a man of a few words uh, 2001, he's of course in the aforementioned Moulin Rouge, which is, mm. which is like a big... Uh, a, a, a big leading role for him, you know. He's the big romantic lead in that. In the, my god, in, every girl in my high school loved that goddamn movie. Hell yeah! yeah. You every couldn't girl land in it. your high school and one little and, queer boy and Mark. <laughs> and Mark. <laughs> I'm, I'm just saying, like, you could not land a date if you had not seen that movie beforehand. Lo- those ladies set those expectations sky goddamn high. Yeah, and every time you go out karaoke, and there's always four girls who who are who are. Uh, yeah, this was just a, a, a little little Moulin Rouge talk where we were just talking about... I believe what I was about to say was that you can't go to karaoke without uh, four girls doing the Lady Marmalade thing. And then Jameson... Yeah, I, I pointed out that friend of the show, Virginia Lynn, can sing all four parts and has done that in one go, yep. on stage at one time. So yeah. that's a great party trick, yeah. And then I believe we... Uh, yeah, we just had like some Moulin Rouge talk. Mark had many things to say about the moon. <laughs> I believe he was saying that that was like... Uh, like how it's not real and how the Earth is flat. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> no, no, yes. no, no, no. Well, you know what? We'll let... Specifically the moon from Moulin Rouge. Yes. The opera singing moon. We'll maybe let him uh, discuss that. All right, so I'm going to go on a little bit of a tangent now about a particular Ewan McGregor movie called Moulin Rouge and how important it was for me because it was a part of my musical awakening, I would say, in my teenage years. And um, my father, bless him, he saw this happening and, and he kind of went with it and was like, I think what was going on in his mind was like, okay, this, I don't understand my son's obsessive love for musicals, um, but if this is going to be happening in my household, how can I steer this in a direction that I can live with? (laughs) And so, so he handed me a copy on DVD of Moulin Rouge and he said, this is a must, a, a must watch for you right now. And bless him because he was right. It's like one of my all-time favorite movies. So Moulin Rouge was a huge part of my teenage years and my musical awakening as I started to kind of delve into the world uh, that I hadn't previously been been really searching, (laughs) if that makes sense. So it it was a really important movie for me, and thank you, Ewan. So that was the first thing that that movie gave me. Was It was an incredibly important part of my musical awakening. The second and maybe most important thing that that movie gave me is the operatic moon. Now, 
if you've seen the movie, you you probably know what I'm talking about, or maybe you don't. But I was not expecting that operatic moon to be in the movie. I mean, it's a moon with a mustache that sings opera. It's brilliant. And also what I did not know was that the operatic moon would become a huge part of my life and what I'm striving for in life. (laughs) If you ask like any of my closest friends and my family members, if you ask them, okay, what's the deal with Mark and his love for the operatic moon? All of them will have at least a couple of instances where I have sang like the operatic moon or kind of been just like messing around with my voice and was just singing opera with words that weren't actually words, even though the operatic moon is singing Italian. Um, but I don't know Italian, so it's usually just open vowel sounds for me. And it kind of it birthed this new thing for me, which happens at our weekly karaoke night. Everybody's invited. Come down to the park pub on Tuesdays starting at 9. Okay. From from the operatic moon, this genre of music that I love to sing called popra was born. And I know I did not make that term up. I can't have made that term up. Somebody else had to have thought of that before me. But I use it anyway. Popra. And basically what happens is I will take a, a very incredibly well-known pop song and I will sing it in the style of the operatic moon. And um, I keep the words. Like, I, I, don't sing, I don't sing my open vowel gibberish. No, I, I sing the real words. But I put it in the style of the operatic moon. And it's really enjoyable for me. So those are two things that this movie has given me that have kind of... It's, it's, this movie has been the gift that has just kept giving. It keeps on giving because it's been a part of my life now since the first time I saw it in my early teenage years, which, not to date myself, but that's been like almost half my life that this movie has been um, influencing the way that I live. And so that right there is enough to just say thank you. Thank you, Ewan. Thank you, Operatic Moon. Thank you, Moulin Rouge. I love you. And that's, uh, that's been my little tangent. Hopefully it wasn't a waste of time for everyone, but um, but I did it anyway. Kind of like when I do Papra. <laughs> All right, back to it. In the cast of this movie, he's also in Black Hawk Down. Oh, oh but but so many people are in Black Hawk Everyone Down. Everyone yeah. is in that movie. And, it was a, and it's a bunch of like people right before they're about to hit big, like mm. Orlando Bloom, Eric Bana... Uh, who else? Uh, Josh Hartnett, I think. Jason is it? Isaacs. Josh Josh Hartnett's the lead. Yeah. Tom Hardy is in that. Jesus. Uh, yeah, just like so many people. And I gotta rewatch that movie. Like, I like that movie. I there. I remember like there's it. like a level of like war movie now where I'm just all like, uh, do I want to sit through this again? I don't know. War hmm. is bad and it seems dumb. And I'm not saying I'm a fan of war. No, I'm just I'm saying just I like saying, the movie. I'm just getting to the point now where like every time I watch a war movie, I I, I come away from it all like, what am I supposed to take away from this? Like, war is bad and dumb, and we should stop doing it. And, and, all right. The, the only kind of war I'm interested in these days is a Star War. <laughs> there we go. That was the joke. <laughs> there we Moving go. on. We <laughs> got to get, like, a tally going. <laughs> and I just I just wanted to bring this up because the timing is really weird, the fact that we're filling in the gap. We're talking about the basically, like, the full cast of um, Black Hawk Down. The one cast member we didn't talk about in Black Hawk Down... The recently departed uh, Tom Sizemore. Oh, yeah. Who passed away really recently. That was one of his last kind of like big roles and everything. And uh, Tom Sizemore, you know, um, he makes me think of the first episode we ever recorded together, Jameson. Reach me. Reach me. And his t- tremendous freak out after Kelsey Grammer slaps him on the golf course. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that's one of like the first times I remember watching a movie with you and just going like, this is strange. Yeah. Why did they film this and release this in a movie? This is an <laughs> odd performance. Mm-hmm. Uh, oh, those heady days of the early podcast. Yes, indeed. Well, rest in <laughs> we'll, peace, Tom we'll, Sizemore. We'll always have Reach Me. We'll always have it. <laughs> uh, 2002, Star Wars Episode 2, Attack of the Clones. <laughs> the worst one <laughs> of, of all the Star Wars. This is the worst one. What's worse? Attack of the, the worst one? What's worse? Attack of the Clones or Rise of Skywalker? Oh. 
Uh, I'm gonna have to say Rise of Skywalker. I mean, Rise of Skywalker is uh, much more of a fresh wound. <laughs> I'm inclined to say that, but it was. I'll it was, tell you this much: I've seen Attack of the Clones maybe like a small handful of times. I have no interest in revisiting Rise of Skywalker. Yeah, it's like you poured sand in a wound. Oh my god! And, and, <laughs> and it gets and, everywhere, and it's coarse. And, and, yes, oh, we were both rushing for that one. Oh, we were tripping over ourselves oh on that my one. Goodness. Gotta let it come organically. Set that up. Uh, yeah. No, I, I I rewatched the prequels back in 2020 when when all the lockdowns happened, and mm. uh, yeah, I think that might have been the first time I watched Attack of the Clones since I saw it in theaters. Uh, garbage movie. Really bad. <laughs> not just not good at all. Hey, I'm just recording this little addendum piece here on my own because as much as I kind of agree with Kaz that Attack of the Clones is not a great movie, I do feel it was the best use of Hugh McGregor as Obi-Wan Kenobi because it was like a little mini detective story that he was going on. He was meeting up with his informant at the diner. He was following up on these leads and he was investigating the clone factory. He went to that rocky planet where um, Christopher Lee was, uh, was holding out at. It was probably Ewan McGregor's best go at Obi-Wan in those prequels because he had the most to do. Anyways, that's just my two cents. Um, 2003, he has a, he has a I've always meant to see this movie because when I was younger, I was kind of writing off a lot of romantic comedies and this one looked like airy romantic comedy and now as I'm a little bit older, I kind of want to like revisit these movies that I, I deemed as, you know, like too girly for me back mm. in the day. Um, yeah. I hear Down With Love is very good. That's him and Renee Zellweger. And it's like a period piece. And, hmm. uh, you know, it's like swinging 50s stuff. Uh, mm-hmm. Here, that's uh, all right. All the power to you, man. Go yeah. ahead. Don't let me stop you. Also, 2003 is in Big Fish. Yep. Uh, very yeah. sort of uh, not typical Tim Burton uh, I was going to say, one of the few Tim Burton movies I can genuinely say I enjoy. Maybe the last good Tim Burton movie? Is there like a, I don't know. Sweeney Todd has its fans, but... I don't know. That's maybe a debate for another day. I like Sweeney Todd, but I, I, well, yeah. I like it, but I don't think it's a great movie. You won't take a bullet for it. <laughs> no. <laughs> 2005, a huge year for Ewan McGregor. Not only does he do the movie we're discussing today, Stay. Oh, not <laughs> crowning <only> achievement. <laughs> does he wrap things up with Star Wars Episode Three: Revenge mm-hmm. of the Sith. Uh, he also does the forgotten Michael Bay film, The Island. I oh. love that movie. Yeah? yeah? I didn't forget it. No? <laughs> <laughs> Keeps you up at night sometimes. I'm saying within, like, maybe, like, the context of, like, Michael Bay's films. No, I get it. Nobody knows. We yeah, remembers that movie at all. Except me. Uh, I mean, I remember it. It's silly. Yeah. Uh, and then this is also the beginning of a, a, a weirdly lucrative voiceover career for Ewan McGregor. Mm-hmm. Uh, a mm-hmm. period where, like, if you had an animated movie and you had, like, like a, a, a genial, lovable hero, who else would get, get Ewan in there and, and make sure you completely erase that Scottish accent of his? We don't mm-hmm. want it. We don't want a trace mm-hmm. of it. Uh, so 2005 is the year that he does both Robots... Which mm-hmm. is a movie about robots. Yep. Yeah. Uh, and also uh, the forgotten Disney movie Valiant, which is about carrier pigeons in World War Two. Oh, yeah, yeah. You sent that one. I that was a I I, I <laughs> maybe floated that as a possibility yeah. because uh, <laughs> truly, well, we do love our animated films here on mm. this podcast. And truly, when was the last time anyone has uh, ever talked about Valiant? I mean, you know what? Rather than just like listing everything you and McGregor has done, I'm just going to list the stuff that I really like. Uh, here's a little, uh, underrated movie from 2009. I Love You, Philip Morris. Oh, yeah. You ever see that one? Yeah, I did. Yeah, that's a really good. good one. That's a, uh, uh, a rare studio movie that's, uh, just a full-on gay romance. It's between him and Jim Carrey. Mm. Uh, but it's also like a crime movie because Jim Carrey plays a con artist, uh, that meets, uh, the, the titular Philip Morris, Ewan McGregor, in prison, falls in love with him, uh, and keeps, um, finding new ways to get himself arrested so he can be uh, with the man that he loves. Oh. Uh, it's a really interesting movie. Uh, it's maybe not perfect, but I think mm. both of them are great. I think both of them uh, very realistically play, uh, you know, two men in love. So uh, that's a good one there. Uh, he's he's weird. He's the su- I'm just going to spoil this. He's the surprise villain in the sequel to the Da Vinci Code: Angels and Demons. Yeah, uh, where he shows up as like the cardinal, and you're going like, wait, why is you and McGregor playing? This very tiny role, and then midway through the movie, you're like, "Oh, because he's obviously he's going to be in another scene later." He's obviously the villain, yeah. right. uh, <clears throat> clearly. Yeah. Uh, he is the uh, love interest in the forgotten Amelia Earhart biopic with Hilary Swank. 
Remember they made a movie about Amelia Earhart and no one went to see it? No. Uh, uh, he's he's one of the titular men who stare at goats. Oh yeah, I've been meaning to see that. Uh, that's that's a movie that exists only as a title. Okay. Yeah. Fair. Uh, he's in a pretty good movie called Beginners. Uh, again, another kind of like gay gay love story. Uh, this one is about uh, Christopher Plummer plays his dad, who after his mom dies comes out as gay. Mm-hmm. Uh, that got Christopher Plummer his Oscar. Uh, he, of course, lest we forget, went salmon fishing in the Yemen. Very important to remember about Ewan McGregor. He went to that Yemen mm-hmm. and he got he got the, them salmon. Uh, he's one of a number of high-profile people that Gina Carano kicks in the face in the movie Haywire. Oh, Anyone fuck. remembers that. I, I watched that movie, and I remember them, like, the idea that I took away from it was, it was her very first movie, so they just brought in a bunch of really good caliber of talent to surround her and support her, and, yeah, that was just, like, that, her, that her movie action is showcase. Yeah. Michael Fassbender, Ewan McGregor, Bill Paxton, Channing Tatum, Antonio Banderas, and Michael Douglas. Just so... A, just a murderer's <laughs> row of, like, the top talent, mm. and then this MMA fighter who, a decade later, will turn out to have very bad beliefs and will get cancelled on Twitter. Yeah. That was the movie that I think they were trying to prop her up as saying, like, hey, well, eventually they're gonna get down to the line of, like, we need to cast Wonder Woman, so... Here's yeah. a, here's a, a a professional fighter with black hair. Let's see what she's got. What she sure. Let's see if she yeah. can act. Uh, the answer was no. Mm. Uh, but they kept <laughs> trying mm. for a while. Uh, she reteams uh, from this movie with Naomi Watts in the uh, hurricane survival movie The Impossible, uh, oh, yeah. which was also the first movie of uh, future Spider Man Tom Holland. Yeah. He's oh. Little, he's a little baby boy in that one. Mm. He was good in that movie. He brought it. You, you watched it recently? No, uh, Tom Holland. Oh, yeah, Tom Holland, yeah. Like, like, that performance yeah. made me cry so much. That's that, that's probably the movie that got him Spider-Man, mm-hmm. even though he was a literal child when he was in that. Yeah. It's a harrowing movie. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's in the, for- the rightfully forgotten Jack the Giant Slayer. Oh, yeah. Uh, don't need more of that. Thanks very much. <laughs> uh, he's in the sprawling cast of, of, of thousands in the uh, theatrical adaptation August Osage County. Yeah. Uh, he's one of many people in that. Uh, once again, doing his flawless American accent. You know what? His American accent's okay. I can yeah. always tell that yeah. it's Ewan McGregor trying to do an American accent, but uh, he's he's better than some people. He's, he's yeah. done it more than enough. I liked his American accent in Fargo, but that's just because, like, the Minnesota accent's fun to do. Yeah. And it's better, okay, it's better than... You and I love you, but it, it's better than his French accent in Beauty and the Beast. Oh, boy. Sure. <laughs> All right. Yeah, that, that's uh, we'll, we'll can, jump. We, can we just jump ahead to that so I can jump. talk about Beauty and the Beast? We're going to jump ahead. We're, we're going to jump all the way ahead. 2017, Bill Condon's Beauty and the Beast, where he is Lumiere. Mm-hmm. Uh, Even the, though Gerard Depardieu was right there. Yeah. <laughs> Come on, he just did the artist. Uh, I know Moulin Rouge was a thing, but, like, here's an actual French song and dance man. I, Jameson confused the actors Jean Dujardin and Gerard Departure. That's it, moving on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I wanted to talk about, like, why they didn't cast the guy from The Artist as Lumiere, because I thought that was way more appropriate for the character. Recent French Oscar winner plays, like, a, 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 sh- a song and dance man in Beauty yeah. and the Beast. I thought, uh, the, the guy from The Artist, because I still can't remember his fucking name, he would have been a shoe-in for yes. the character Lumiere, and I mistook him for Gerard Depardieu, who, if I recall correctly, was a guy who, like, got into a brawl on an airplane and pissed on somebody. He was a, he was a famous French actor from the 90s. Jean Dujardin is a famous French actor from, like, the double zeros. That's, yeah. that's basically it. Yeah, that, that, my, co- my mistake. And, of course, the great irony of all of this is the original Lumiere is played by Jerry Orbach, who is... Very American, mm-hmm. so it was, and he was, and he's still the best. Yeah, so I was a like, cast like very Scottish. You and McGregor for it, you, and then I forgot about Moulin Rouge. You so and, that's kind of oh, okay. That's the connect tissue. You and McGregor is a singularly weird choice for that role. Yeah, you will never hear me disagree with that. Yeah, yeah. and the, and the artist was like fresh in people's memory, so you know, why not cast him as Lumiere? Anyways, that that was the that's point it. I wanted that's, to make. Uh, that's the last I want to talk about. <laughs> Yeah, no, I mean, like, just Jean Dujardin, you look at him, and he, he is, he's the human personification of Lumiere. It's yeah. Like, this is what a can, this is what a French candlestick looks like as a <laughs> human being. Yeah. Uh, also in the same year that he did Beauty and the Beast, uh, he was in the sequel that I don't think anyone was expecting, Trainspotting 2. Yeah. Which was a book. Uh, the book was called Porno. 
Mm. Uh, I can I think I can maybe understand why they changed the James Bond too. <laughs> yeah. Uh, very weird movie. Uh, it, it really didn't need much of it. Really didn't need it, a Does that book also take place like 20 odd years I after think, the original? So, really? Probably. Oh. Yeah. Huh. Uh, he is in the uh, kind of very sweet uh, Disney film Christopher Robin. As the titular of the Christopher Robin. Oh, I love that movie. That's a very sweet, that's a very <laughs> nice little movie. Uh, an, an excellent movie, 2019. He's in the uh, Shining sequel, Doctor Sleep. Yeah. yeah. That's a hell of a good movie. Mm, He's yeah, excellent in that. He, of course, uh, plays uh, Roman Saronis the Black Mask in Birds of Prey. Oh, yeah. Uh, he bl- blows up, gets a gets a, a grenade down his pants. Uh, and then twice. Mary, twice his, uh, his now wife is in that too, as right? His now wife, yeah. uh, Mary Elizabeth Winston, is, yeah. is, is in that, yes. Mm. Uh, although I believe they met before that. On Fargo. On Fargo. <laughs> and then uh, last year, 2022, he provided the voice of the cricket in Guillermo del Toro's Pinocchio. Mm. Uh, the other Pinocchio movie. Uh, the good we, one, right? The good one that yeah. we didn't get around to talk. It's. Really? Have you seen it? Uh, Have you seen the list? Oh, man. Watching so, it before the uh, Oscars. What a beautiful, <laughs> what a beautiful <laughs> fucking movie. Uh, yeah, so that's, um, uh, leaving out all the movies, uh, and, God, he's been in a lot of movies, so, mm. yeah, it would take a while to run down the entire thing, but that's... But that's, you tried! Those are the highlights <laughs> of, uh, Ewan's career, uh, I don't think, I think, I think we covered all of, like, the big ones, I don't yeah. think we really, really missed anything. Any, uh, any thoughts, Mark, on, uh, movies that we just went through? <laughs> More so, like, I don't think he cares if the movie did well or not, like... Can you imagine doing that many movies and just getting to work with so many awesome people? It doesn't matter really how it turns out. Like, quantity. (laughs) Quantity. (laughs) I think he's happy with that. And I think I would be happy if I ever got to do that many, like, projects, you know? I don't think it matters to him. Maybe it does. I'm speaking for you, Ewan. (laughs) But I don't think it matters to him whether like it had success in terms of box office revenue mm-hmm. or not. I think he enjoys the experience of it and looked like so many movies that he got to work mm-hmm. on, so many different projects. I mean, yeah. that to me is like, that's more of something to like envy about him. It's like, he doesn't seem to have a huge ego to be like, no, I'm too good for that thing. Yeah. He's yeah. like, no, this sounds like fun. Yeah. I'll do it. Some of them are going to be good. Some of them are maybe I'll not. Do, I'll, do, I'll do your independent thing. I'll do your huge blockbuster. I'll voice those travel ads that yeah. play in yeah. front of all the movies every time we go. And I'll, I'll do them. a Bitcoin ad. I'll you know, it sounds like he'll take... Lemons, lemons, lemons. <laughs> yeah. You know, he, he just seems like, yeah, he's not going to turn down a good opportunity when he sees yeah. it, but his true passion in life is just doing these road trip specials yeah. on his motorcycle. So, like, he's always got, like, one eye on that prize, and he yeah. does these, you know, super successful blockbusters and great beloved animated films so yeah. he could, like, fucking, you know, fund his uh, his travel hobby. Yeah. And what's not to love about that? Just supplementary income. <laughs> his feature yeah. films are supplementary income. <laughs> he's gotta pay for gas somehow. <laughs> well, and lodgings. <laughs> As those shows have told us. I have no idea. I have no idea what my point was. I have no idea what those shows were telling us. I think... It's I, lost I, to time. I, I think I was trying to make a joke on the fact that the show was called Long Way Around. It's a long way around for the show, and it's a long way around for you, and I don't know. As I said earlier, I don't know what I'm fucking talking about. I just fucking bullshit in my mouth. All flowing by the seat of our pants. Exactly. But I think this was around the, the point in the recording where I think we might have clued in on the fact that we might have lost some stuff. So I think we might have been scrambling at we, this point. Yeah, we we were. That was like a solid twenty minutes of bullshitting. Yes, like, waiting for like the audio to catch up and the um, timestamp to, to line up. But basically, this is the end of of things. We should naturally get, transition. Naturally to transition the into throat. the part of the episode that didn't that we didn't lose. <laughs> so we hope you have enjoyed this peek behind <laughs> the curtains. I know we did. Yeah, we had some fun mm. on a Sunday morning trip down memory lane. <laughs> remember, remember last week. Yeah. Oh, we were so young. Oh, uh, those heady days. All right. Uh, thank you for staying with us. And we we promise this won't happen again unless you like this, in which case this is the new format. Oh, God. <laughs> we, we hope this doesn't happen again. But if it does, we've jury rigged a solution. Yeah. But right now, let's just go ahead and take a little break and we'll put a charity spot here. When we come back, we'll talk about Stay Stay Tuned. Stay tuned, everyone. Stay tuned. Oh. It's the name of the movie. And I'm working that in. Other Stay Jokes. <laughs> uh, so organic. Yeah. 
Last month, a Norfolk Southern train derailed in the small town of East Palestine, Ohio. Carrying a cargo of toxic chemicals, the derailment and controlled release of the hazardous materials forced an evacuation of the town's nearly 5,000 residents for several days unless they face imminent health risks. However, the state's authorities' initial refusal of federal help from the EPA have exponentially delayed the recovery efforts. Moreover, their insistence that residents could return home is a harrowing case of negligence given the amount of airborne toxins and water source contamination in the area. As of this recording in March, several residents and cleanup workers are still reporting imminent health concerns with additional aid still facing partisan gridlock. In these instances, local charities and nonprofits have stepped up and turned their efforts toward helping the people of East Palestine face this crisis. They are providing desperately needed bottled water, cleaning supplies, gas cards, and more to the residents, affording them crisis relief in a short term and committed to serving East Palestine for the long haul. If you would like to assist the victims of the East Palestine Norfolk Southern train derailment disaster, please visit donorbox.org slash east dash palestine dash crisis dash relief and make a donation. Once again, that link is donorbox.org slash east dash palestine dash crisis dash relief. Mm. So stay. Yeah. Uh, from what, what about this piece of Wonder, shit? Wonderful Justin Bieber song. I don't know if you know it. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? I have it. What? Is that a Justin Bieber song? Who, Does that exist? Who the fuck is Justin Bieber? The <laughs> <laughs> joke of we Justin? find funny for a reason. I can explain that joke. Uh, yeah. Won't. Uh, stay. Uh, it is directed by German director Mark Forster. He has one of these careers where it's where it's like he, he is what I would call like a very successful director. He continues to work. He's made like a, a ton of movies. Mm. What he doesn't have is like a distinct style. There's nothing that like mm. draws you particularly to a Mark Forster movie. He just directs a movie. You got a movie? Mark Forster will direct it. I'm yeah. going to list off his filmography here. And I guarantee you it will be filled with movies that you have heard of and did not realize were all directed by the same person. Okay. Mm. So his first big breakout movie, he has an independent movie in 2000 called Everything Put Together. That movie barely exists, so I won't spend any time talking about that. His big break is in 2001 is the film Monster's Ball. Yep. I saw that on the poster. Yes, indeed. Familiar with that. Uh, one Miss Halle Berry heard the Academy Award for Best Actress. To date, still... The only black actress to win the Academy Award. That's pretty mm, cool. They should probably get on that. They could probably... Um, I thought Viola Davis won. She won Best Supporting. Oh, uh, okay, yes. okay. Lead, lead actor. Mm. Did you guys either you see Monsters Ball? No. A very depressing movie. <laughs> All right. Very depressing movie <laughs> where... Uh, Halle Berry gets uh, super naked, uh, but like... What's depressing about that? It's like in like a sad way. It's oh, like a sad no. naked. Okay. Uh, and then that was her era of getting naked on film, because that was the same year as Swordfish. Mm. So she was getting it all out. Aaron, Aaron those berries. <laughs> I'm moving on from this. Then he has a real run of movies. He does 2004 to 2008. He does a movie a year. Mm. His next year, you know, Monsters Ball, he had a lot of luck with Oscars with that. So uh, his next movie is following up on that. It's the 2004 film Finding Neverland. Wow. Oh, yeah. Uh, Johnny Depp, he's an author. He meets a family. He's inspired to write the uh, story Peter Pan. Mm -hmm. uh, the little kid in that is uh, the same kid who played Charlie and Charlie in the Chocolate Factory. The good doctor himself. Uh, Mr. Freddie Highmore. So, uh, Mark Forster, he's got like two uh, big Oscar successes back to back. Uh, his next film is Stay. Oh. oh. And uh, Mark <laughs> Forster has uh, not made a movie that has been nominated for an Academy This Award is the movie says. that killed a career, huh? This is huh? the movie where everything starts going down. Yeah, I, yeah, I can see that. <laughs> I can uh, see people not wanting to hire this guy afterwards. So, the very next year, of course, he does like this twisty, mind bendy thriller. Uh, so, naturally. That was the twisty. This is the twisty, mind bendy this thriller. Is the, yeah, this is the one with the movie we're talking oh, about. Oh, boy. Of course, he follows that up naturally. With the Will Ferrell film Stranger Than Fiction, mm, okay. where he I hear, love that film actually. I like that film too. Yeah. I think <laughs> I think some people don't care for that movie. I will I will always go to bat for that. Of course, you know it's... what? Any Will Ferrell movie, there's a big list of haters. Just it doesn't matter what it is. Yep. You yeah. know, Elf. I love Elf. Who hates Elf? Okay. Find me uh, one person on the internet. Who doesn't hates friend of the show Tashana hate that? Well, movie? that doesn't. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but she's allowed her to have her opinions. Fair. But, uh, <laughs> yeah. um, 2006, Stranger Than Fiction. 2007, he did The Kite Runner. 
uh, which yeah. was based on like a really popular book, book of the time. Yeah. I don't know if anyone remembers this about two Afghanistan children who who have a bunch of trials and tribulations and, mm. and have some hardships. Uh, like a super popular book, but like... So, sorry, I just mistook that for the Maze Runner. <laughs> and, very, very different. Roughly the same thing. That's basically the same. All right. Uh, yeah, but that movie, that that was really like his ne- his next stab. And like, I gotta get back into this Oscars, Oscars contender. I gotta get back yeah. in here. Mm. I'll take a book that, that everyone loves. It's, it's super popular. And no one liked the movie. And also, you know, because it's a story about uh, people from Afghanistan, there aren't really any celebrities in it. So it's a movie that is completely faded from memory. Mm. Uh, And of course, naturally, he followed that up, 2008, uh, with Quantum of Solace, the second uh, Daniel Craig James Bond movie. Oh, the one everybody Uh, hated. There's some okay stuff in Quantum of Solace. There's some okay, like action beats or whatever. The, The thing with that movie is that that was the one that was trying to be a Jason Bourne movie. It was like, we just rebooted James Bond. Oh, James Bond's not as popular as Jason Bourne. What if we just made a James Bond movie like a Jason Bourne movie? Mm. And everyone went to see it. It's all like, this is hard to watch. Mm. You keep shaking the camera and yeah, yeah. Uh, making me throw up in my seat. <laughs> uh, so then he take a couple of years off. 2011, he comes back with Machine Gun Preacher, mm. which is not as cool as it sounds. <laughs> Uh, it's not as, not as exploitive as it sounds. It's uh, it's a, based on a true story. Gerard Butler, I guess, played a biker who finds God and saves like a bunch of people's lives. Michael Shannon is in it. Uh, then of course, 2013, another huge blockbuster that kind of doesn't exist: World War Z. Oh, that was the guy, huh? That was the guy yeah. who directed that. Huh. And so, yeah, so now he's got, like, a James Bond movie and a Brad Pitt fights the undead movie, and they're both kind of movies no one ever talks about anymore. Hmm. Moving on from that, 2016, he does a fully forgotten uh, nothing movie called All I See Is You. Blake Lively plays a blind woman who gets her sight back and then thrilling stuff happened thriller mm. oh it sounds kind of <laughs> sounds kind of stayish mm. might want to stay away from that one uh, oh there's that title drop there we again. go it's gonna happen all the time i want you to stay I want you to stay 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 no that was bad i'm gonna cut that you know what call this out stay stay isn't call that this out. wasn't that the paul mccartney it. michael <laughs> jackson song the girl is mine stay 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 whatever I fuck it <laughs> uh, 2018 a movie we've just talked about christopher robin yeah he's back with with uh, Ewan McGregor, and mm. uh, he directed that, and then uh, he has a movie currently in theaters right now, the Tom Hanks drama A Man Called Otto. Mm. That's him. Uh, he's Otto. Well, he's going around. He's not happy. He's a bit of a grump. And he's got a cat. That's literally the plot of A Man Called Otto. I don't know. I haven't seen it, but like the, uh, the trailer uh, uh, leads me to believe. And then... <laughs> <laughs> the next movie he is coming out. Now, this is really fascinating, Mark. I was actually going to bring up this movie on its own before I realized the director of Stay is directing this. He is directing one of the most bonkers sequels, just in terms of, like, idea and connective tissue that I've ever heard of. It is a sequel, or I should rather say it's a follow-up to a movie that you are in, Mark. <gasps> oh, wow. He is directing... <laughs> White Bird, oh, colon, a wonder, a wonder yeah. story. Mm-hmm. Mark, of course, <laughs> is in the uh, the film of Wonder. Mm-hmm. Uh, he he plays the, uh, the 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 doctor. You 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 give uh, you don't give birth, but you deliver. <laughs> you deliver the titular <laughs> Wonder Boy. What kind of movie is this about? Yeah. You're giving uh, you gave birth. To yes. a little, little baby Wonder Boy. Yes, I birthed. You, you helped boy. deliver. You birthed the Wonder Boy. <laughs> helped deliver. Which I assume is the character's name. Yes. And not having seen the movie, I assume he's called Wonder Boy. Yeah. Um, but have, have you heard of this follow up? Yes, I have. Yeah. Are you waiting for that phone call? No. <laughs> okay. It, 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 it is, but you, you've heard what the movie is. You've heard of. This is like the most like insane big swing. I have ever heard a follow-up to a movie take. Wait, I think I saw a little blurb. Like, doesn't the bully grow up and is now the leading character? Okay, or something? so the bully is the connective tissue between uh. the two movies. That is the only thing that carries over from the movie. Julia Roberts, not in the movie. Owen Wilson, not in the movie. Little Baby Wonder Boy, not in the movie. Maybe the teenage doctor. Mark, Mark Dosma? <laughs> I don't know. They could, they could, they could edit you in any, anytime soon. But yeah, no, the 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 connective 
tissue of, of these sequels, the thing that makes it a wonder story yeah. uh, is that the bully, a very minor character from the first movie, uh, he gets expelled for, for bullying the Wonder Boy, mm-hmm. and he has to move cities, and he has to move in with his grandmother, played by Helen Mirren, mm-hmm. who yeah. tells him a story about when she was a young girl in World War II. And that's the movie. The movie is this World War II story about, like, two youngsters in love, and it is tenuously connected to the movie Wonder, because a minor character from that movie is hearing someone tell him this story. Mm. Wild. Wild <laughs> that, that they thought fun. that that is a thing that should be made? Yeah. And no disrespect to the, the Wonder Cinematic Universe, <laughs> but that's what, that's crazy that they're okay. making that. <laughs> that's a movie that's coming out. It blows my mind. And then the two other movies he has in production right now, he's completing his trilogy with Ewan. They are making a movie together called The Cow, mm. which is a World War One movie about a soldier who tries to... Get a cow! I don't know. There's not a lot uh, written, written about this movie right now. Uh, and then uh, the other movie that he's currently working on right now, very exciting, Untitled Thomas the Tank Engine movie. Wow. So yeah, this guy, it just got his fingers in all sorts of different just pies. Just journeyman director. Just journeyman you know? director. He'll say uh, everything. And then of course... He is the Ewan McGregor of directors. He truly is. And then of course the other big name uh, we have to announce is that this is an original screenplay by David Benioff. The co-creator of Game of Thrones. Ah. I uh, was wondering why that name sounded familiar when I yeah, was uh, Benny Yeah, Benioff and Weiss, mm. uh, who does also have like like a, 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 a weird random film career. It, the first movie he wrote was the excellent, excellent Spike Lee film, 25th Hour, uh, which is actually based on his novel. So he adapted his own novel for that. Uh, then he wrote the screenplay for the Brad Pitt action movie, Troy. Mm. Uh, or his Achilles. Yeah, oh yeah, I know that. Uh, big old, big old abs. Lots of abs Lots in that movie. Many abs. Mm. Uh, then he does Stay, and then he actually does two Mark Forster movies back to back because he wrote Stay, and then he also wrote The Kite Runner. Uh, then in two thousand and nine, he wrote Brothers, uh, which is a um, Hulk Hogan uh, biopic. Nope. Okay. Uh, Jake Gyllenhaal and Tobey Maguire, right. and they go to like Afghanistan or something or Iraq. I don't know. It's like so a Tobey's got PTSD. Or Tobey's something. got PTSD, yeah. and I think Jake Gyllenhaal is sleeping with Natalie Portman, his wife. Mm. Uh, also in two thousand and nine, very funny that you noticed um, uh, my Seven Eleven cup, which is holding all of my pens. Yeah. He also wrote the screenplay for X Men Origins Wolverine. Mm. Wow. Uh, the worst X-Men movie, yeah. which is saying a lot. <laughs> uh, and then the only other screenplay he has in between that and Game of Thrones uh, is he has a screenplay credit on the Will Smith action movie Gemini Man. Oh. Remember that when there was two of them? Yeah. He was finding his the younger de- the self. The de-aging technology. Yeah, yeah so he's, yeah. he's working on that. So uh, that's the people who made the movie. Mm. So why don't we talk about the movie? Sure. Let's see, uh, where the fuck do we begin? Jesus Christ. Well, First off, have you watched Origins uh, recently at all? No, why? Why would you? No, I never even okay. began it. <laughs> so I played through the PS3 game. A great a, a great video game adaptation of a terrible movie. Yeah. One of the best video game adaptations of a movie overall, yeah. I would say, which is the weird thing. Yeah, and yeah. it's from my brother's podcast that I was on with him. Ooh. So I, we had to rewatch the movie, and I will say, I remember... Remember it being worse than it actually is. Like I rewatched it and okay. I was like, "It's not great, but is it as bad as everybody says?" Mm. I don't think so. If you rewatch, it's like it does some fun things. There's a lot of bad stuff in it. Like it does, <laughs> it's just just terrible stuff. But, <laughs> uh, but yeah. uh, what, what, what would you say is a highlight from it? Okay, let me go back. <laughs> let me go. Well, back. let's not go. Let's not get carried away. Like it highlights. We, st- we still have an entire movie to discuss. Yes, that's true. Yeah, <laughs> let's not go there. I'll, yeah, fair. I'll yeah, think about that. Uh, but but I will say, just give it another watch. Maybe a, a, a nice smooth watch. We I don't have to sit through the whole thing. I, w- <laughs> I, I went to see X Men Origins Wolverine in theaters the day that I got fired from my video store job. Oh, uh, and I went in with a full bottle of wine that I snuck into my backpack, uh, and I had a miserable time because that movie sucks shit, and I did yeah. not. I was like, I gotta do something to cheer me up. How was the wine? And I left, uh, it was, you know, it was... It was backpack wine. It was reasonably priced. Gotcha. I didn't spend more than $20 because, as I stated, I was unemployed Mm. at the time. Put the box in the backpack with... (laughs) That was a bottle. That was a bottle. I kept it classy. Mm. I just lift my backpack up every time I need to take a fucking... 
We've gone like a cup. <laughs> All right, so we're a little over 16 minutes into this <laughs> second recording. Let's and talk there's about so much God, in this damn. movie. Let's, we need to fucking let's get talk to. about let's talk about stay. All right, All right. So the movie opens with Ryan Gosling surviving a car crash and walking away from the car crash, and then we cut to uh, him meeting uh, a psychiatrist or. The psychiatrist who is played by Ewan McGregor, and he is taking on Ryan Gosling as a patient because his regular psychiatrist can't make their appointment. So he says, "Hey, one, take take over for me for the for this week. We got a we got a, a car crash survivor." And I don't know, I don't know about you two, but that was exactly the moment that I realized, oh, this is going to be one of those movies. The, <laughs> the second that Ryan Gosling said, "Like." you're not my regular psychiatrist. And then Ewan McGregor was just like, no, but I fill in for her sometimes. So I, I, just, just the idea that Ryan Gosling is all like, this seems unlikely. And then Ewan McGregor just kind of like passes it off with like, no, no, it's perfectly fine. Who the fuck are you? Dr. Sam Foster. You must be Henry. Where's Dr. Levy? Didn't she get in touch with you? No. Oh, I'm sorry. She's away for a while. I'm covering for her. She's away where? She's not feeling well. She'll be back in a couple of weeks. What are you, a substitute shrink? I guess you could call me that. That was the moment where I'm all like... That doesn't right. really happen. No, that doesn't happen, <laughs> but like you said it in a way where it's all like, you think that it happens, mm. which means that you're planning something, movie. Mm -hmm. And I am suspicious, and I don't know if I like what... <laughs> I don't know if I like the tone of your voice. <laughs> uh, I'm gonna keep my eye on you, movie. <laughs> okay, I, I floated this near the beginning, and I just want to maybe like put it on the table again. Should we reveal the twist up top? How easy do you think it will be for you to discuss the plot of the movie Stay without letting everyone know kind of what's going on well, in the movie? Well, the problem I is, I think, once we reveal what the hell's going on, like, we can't really do the insane things that happen in the movie justice, because then people just explain, like, oh, but it doesn't matter anyways. Oh, it's... Okay, so if I you don't want, know. It's, fine. If you want to keep a lid on it, we'll keep a lid on it, and I'll try if, not to. I'll try not to reveal my hand too much. But once again, just remember, uh, nothing matters. Uh, yeah, there you <laughs> go. Just keep yeah. that in the back of your head. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Nothing, nothing we say uh, really holds any water. Sure. Uh, yeah. In this, mm. um, yeah. So yeah, it opens with the car crash, and it's almost like the movie kind of wants you to forget about the car crash because mm. we're told conflicting things. We're constantly told conflicting information in this movie. We're told that Ryan Gosling torched his car mm -hmm. on purpose. He, he stopped his car in the middle of the bridge, set it on, set it ablaze, mm -hmm. and then walked away. But literally the first thing we see in this movie is a car flip over. Yes. And we keep seeing flashbacks to the car flip over. Yeah. And each time we see the flashbacks, like, a little bit more about the preceding events to the car crash are revealed to us, this movie is keeping us on our toes. It's changing its narrative on you, and it's keeping you guessing. Yes. Yeah. Uh, but in a terrible way. It's, it's a <laughs> film where scenes repeat, mm -hmm. where lines of dialogue repeat, mm -hmm. uh, where there are very obvious... Misdirections. Misdirections. There are very obvious visual cues that you want to, the, the filmmakers want you to clue in on. Oh, yeah. You will see extras walking in the background, and two people will basically be identical. Hey, oh, hey, hey, nice. They are, <laughs> that was, was that a point yeah. that you wanted yeah. to get to? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> was, was, Mark was all like, oh, I, I wasn't the only one. I thought that was just me. I thought it was just me that noticed it. No, that's very oh, intentional. Uh, yeah, very yeah. intentional. No. There's like sets of twins in the background yeah. constantly. Yeah. I, I like this movie took me a little bit longer than usual to fill through because I, I kept noticing stuff like, wait a second. And it kept like rewinding going yeah. back. And it's not so much that like background actors like are all identical because they'll be, just be like groups of two or three all together. But those individual groups of two and three are dressed the same. They have the same cadence. So, like, this movie is constantly making you double takes and go, like, wait, wait, did I see that right? And that's tell they're trying to tell me that, no, no, you pay attention to every single thing that goes on in this movie. Look, watch the background. Watch how the way scenes are constructed. Yeah. Watch how lines are delivered. Remember what each character is telling you, but yeah. also, like, don't rely on it too heavily because, like, you know, every every character is is like an unreliable yeah. character. It's a movie that that forces you to 
stare intently at every image on screen and every all, all the ancillary characters in the background. There's stuff that happens in this that feel like continuity errors until mm. like a second later you realize, no, that was intentional. Yeah. Like at one point in time, I, I won't talk about the scene because this is jumping way ahead, but at one point in time, someone flips a, a chessboard over on a table and then in the next shot it's back up and all the pieces yeah. are back there and there's like a brief moment where all like, oh, they fucked up and they were like, no, wait, you know what? They're doing the, they're doing this bullshit on purpose though. Yeah. That's that's not like a yeah. Yeah, um, they, there'll be cases where like they will have literally shot three different variations of the same scene, and then they will show you those three ones, and, and they, they just play them. Yeah, yeah. like one after the other. Like, it's like a, it's a fucking you know Dormammu have come here to bargain scene. <laughs> Fuck, you know what? We may as well just spoil it. <laughs> I, I think I think by talking about what this movie actually is about mm. we actually can bring a little more depth to our conversation sure. in the movie yeah and o- honestly we can keep it to our chests we could we could like not reveal it until the end of the movie like the movie does honestly by talking about it and by talking around it i guarantee you the audience will figure it out before we get there because i figured it out before oh you we did got there oh, well well see- because okay, I didn't figure everything out, but I kind of got the gist of like none of this is real. Well, or, yeah, you know, like something like, this, this this feels artificial. Like lines people are dropping, where it's mm-hmm. all like, oh, that's not that's not those voices aren't in your head. They're they're yeah. real life voices. It's all like, mm. yeah, the way he said that made me think that maybe it's the same thing. Um, but yeah, it's definitely one of those things where, like, when I watch a movie that I am just not into whatsoever, mm-hmm. I start trying to get ahead of the movie and predicting sure. where where it's going. And even like, you know, I'm totally just hazarding guesses, pulling them out of my ass. Nah, no, nah, there's, 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 I could not, I could not pred- predict so it most of this. Did, before we reveal it, what did you guys think was going on? Ooh, what were some? Mark, you go what first because I some ha- early theories you had as to what was what was where this was leading. I thought they were setting us up to be to fight club it. I thought they mm-hmm. were going to be the same person, and maybe even his girlfriend is all just different versions of him, mm-hmm. and like his need to save everybody was a part of his personality. Um, and that's where I thought they were going with it. And I, yeah. I mean, this is a, this is a very Fight Club esque movie. This is a mm. very early two thousands movie. It is shot largely through like yellow and green filters, and like everything, all the scenes look gross. All the the, the camera composition looks like oh, sewage. God. It's just it's a it's a thoroughly unpleasant movie to look at. Mm. Um, and it does have a bit of a Fight Club vibe. Even more so that one of the pieces of trivia I learned about this movie is that the original director of this movie was, was going to be Fickner. Was going to be David Fick, Fick, Fincher? Fincher. 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 Thinking of William, William Fickner. Fickner. William thinking of is William that Fickner. I almost, because he was in Black Hawk Down. Yeah. <laughs> pretty much, yeah. yeah. Um, and you know what, Mark? You're kind of not wrong. <laughs> you know? Yeah. You're kind of on the right oh, track. So uh, here's how, here's the depths to, I was like looking into this. So when I put this up on Amazon Prime and they give you like the sort of the three bullet point tags of like what kind of genre this is. And the three tags that jumped out to me were cerebral, thriller, and LGBTQ. Yeah, and you, you sent me that screenshot. I'm all like, huh? What? All right, now here's here's is this what a, is this a Babadook situation where it gets placed in the wrong thing? Yeah, I mean it had to be, but like clear well, text stay. So and you're and you just met me, so you might hate me when I kind of go into this a little bit more. But I had this feeling that oh, there's going to be like a a subtext to this movie where it's about queer identity. You follow me along on this? So no, absolutely not. All right, all right. All. So we got two. We got two leads here. We got you and McGregor, and we got Ryan Gosling at his at his most prettiest. Sure. He's oh, the yeah. year after the notebook. <laughs> he's got that wispy fucking. Oh, both yeah. Gosling and McGregor's hair are ridiculous. Yes, in this yeah. movie mm. for completely different reasons. <laughs> right. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, derailing. but but going back to the to the Fight Club thing of them like both inhabiting the same like yeah. being the same person, different variations of that personality. Here was my theory. All right, you and McGregor came out of the closet to his parents. The mother died, and the dad went on to live. Now, fo- fo- follow me on this, all right? I'm I know. Not following you, all, I'm all, not right, on track. all right. When he inhabits the gay persona, that's Ryan Gosling. But when he's in the closet, it's you and McGregor. I I didn't think this was possible, but I am so thankful we got the movie we got. <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, well, hey, there, there's a moment like later on where he says, like, oh, my, my parents died. Let's toy with the idea that perhaps the mother rejected her son coming out and died in, like, ran out into traffic, whatever. As mothers often do when sons reveal their sexual yeah. orientation to the right of the traffic. Yeah, the dad. Like Shelly Winters and yeah. Lolita. The, the, now, now Ewan McGregor just feels, you know, uh, heartbroken about what he did to his mother. He feels, like, withdrawn, feels ashamed of himself. He's not letting his, his true colors fly. The dad is alive, but he's gone blind. So he doesn't even see his son as who he really is. And he treats him as, like, this whole other identity. But when Ryan Gosling meets the dad, he's like, that's my father. No, no, it's not. And it's only at the end of the movie when he cures the dad of his blindness does he recognize him as... You, you just jumped. You just leapfrogged into, like, <laughs> three different plot points of the movie that we hadn't even gotten to yet. We are all over the place. You asked me what my theories Much were. Much like the plot of the movie, Stay. Uh, th- there's not even, like, a single gay character in this movie. No, there isn't. So what the hell is that LGBTQ really tag annoying. doing on there? I think because, like, the still image was just, like, um, Ewan McGregor with, like, his frosted tips looking looking like a like a, like a a real rent boy. It's a, it's a uh, bait and switch. <laughs> it is a little bit of a bait and switch, yeah. Mm. I mean, there's, a tr- there's attractive people in this movie, so it must be LGBTQ. Mm. The first thing I wrote down was emo Ryan Gosling makes me happy. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> I think he could take, like, the Tobey Maguire emo Spider-Man. He could yeah. take that trophy. If people actually watch this movie. He's very sad. He's very sad in this movie. Mm. He's very sad in Although this movie. Although he doesn't. never. <laughs> he doesn't do any of that. <laughs> there is a dance scene, though. But he's not in it. He's just he's just watching it in the rain. Yeah. There's a dance scene? Yeah. Between who? Well, it's between... Uh, we'll get to it, but it's like, he's not dancing. He's just watching the dancers. And the, he's watching a dance oh, class. Oh, God, that's right. Yeah. Oh, my God. So much fucking happens in this yeah. movie. All right, look. Maybe we can, shouldn't have spoiled... <laughs> can we talk about the twist? Yes. Can we talk yes. about... Just do it. Okay. All right. So... Basically, the thing to know about the movie Stay is, and I'm going to do my best, mm-hmm. everything that we are watching is not actually happening. The car crash at the beginning actually happened. Uh, all three of the passengers in the car with Ryan Gosling have died. He is the only one who has survived, but he is he will be dead soon. He's, he is actually he is, dying. He is bleeding to death on the side of the road. And uh, as as he is flitting in and out of consciousness, he is taking the faces of the of the the crowd of people that have surrounded around him, the, the witnesses, the passerbys, and he is recasting them <laughs> in this fake reality yeah. <laughs> with new names and identities. Mm-hmm. Backstories. Yeah, people who he would only see, like, a glimpse of their faces now have, like, full names and, and character development mm-hmm. and, like, backstories and shit like that. I mean, not even not even all of that. But, like, yes, <laughs> the, the entire... In his wildest fantasy, he's not even the main character no. of his own story. And this, and this <laughs> must all be... Like, like, this unfolds over, like, an hour and a half for us, the viewer. Mm. But in real time, this is all happening within, like... Seconds, like 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 a half like a, like a half second. Yeah, that it must be like like the the, re- the reality of this world that he has created. That Ewan McGregor as the character as the psychiatrist character whose name I didn't even write Sam. Yeah, uh, who Sam uh, is like slowly unraveling as a character because Sam is our protagonist. Mm-hmm. Ewan McGregor in the dream scenario is yeah. ostensibly the lead character of this movie, mm-hmm. but he is playing not a real person. He's yeah. like the first responder at the uh, at the fucking car. Yeah, he's just yeah. like a regular guy yeah. who like shows up and like tries to like help um, uh, apply pressure to Ryan Gosling's broken body or whatever. Mm-hmm. And Ryan Gosling's subconscious has cast him in the lead role <laughs> as as of, of, of his last week of his life story. Yeah, yes, in which he is a supporting character <laughs> fully. He is not the lead of this story. Uh, and that's the movie. Thanks for listening, it's, everybody. It's <laughs> wild. But now that we have that. Mm-hmm. Now, now, we, now that we have that out of the that out of the way, we can like talk about just kind of like how insane the, the setup of this is. Because mm-hmm. uh, like, not only do uh, I mean, like, the more you think about this, the more it just completely falls apart. Like how, because like the world that he has populated is full of more people than the handful of people that are surrounding him on the bridge as they're watching. There are certain faces. 
that we are able to gleam on because they are paid, played by recognizable character actors. Mm-hmm. Uh, and and some of them get double cast. Yeah. Uh, this is an early role for uh, Sterling K. Brown, mm-hmm. uh, who's, who's great, who shows up early as like uh, a co-worker of McGregor's who just comes in and he is told to like sit down on a couch and, mm. and wait his turn. Yeah. And I'm all like, oh, it's a really small role for Sterling K. Brown. Then, then, he's, then he's gone for the movie for about like like an hour and a half and then he shows up in like a rehearsal for Hamlet as an actor and I thought like, oh, is he like a, he moonlights as an actor? Is he just in like a community different theater? Character. No. Different Completely character. different character Completely as written in the, character. in the IMDb page. Uh, yeah. yeah uh, uh, Mark Margolis from... Um, uh, Breaking Bad, uh, mm-hmm. the dude in the wheelchair, the, the bell. bell and everything like that. He's like an angry guy on the subway who tells Gosling to stop smoking. And then later on, he's also the owner of a bookstore. This keeps happening. Like, people keep switching roles. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, it's super weird. Yeah. And it doesn't really make sense. I kind of like the idea of, of, of this twist. Like, now that I kind of, like, know what's what this movie is all about, what it was trying to do... I think there could be an interesting, good version of this. I think what they needed to do was go all the way with it and have literally a cast of, like, ten people. And then all the people who aren't, like, the leads, who aren't Ewan McGregor and Naomi Watts, who, oh, God, we haven't even talked about. We're, half- <laughs> We're so leaping to the episode, we haven't even mentioned we have, yeah, we have We haven't brought up the other cast of characters yeah. and the um, events of the plot. But, like, you have, you have your leads, and then you have your background people. You have Sterling K. Brown. You have B.D. Wong. I got some things to say about BD1 mm. in this movie. You have all these people. They need to play all of the extras. You need to, mm. and maybe this is too hard of a movie to make in 2005. Now I think you could pull it off. Now it's all like, if there's like a, if, if, if there's like a, a, a downtown shot of New York, I want to see at least 30 Sterling K. Browns walking around in the background. Mm. Like get them in different outfits or whatever, but yeah. like that's he's, what you, he's the shopkeeper in this one. He's the yeah. police officer on the beat. He's yeah. like if an old, this is, he's an old man playing chess. Yeah, yeah. This is what you're establishing. You can't also have a, a citywide cast of extras. That doesn't make sense within the reality of, of Henry's dying fantasy world or whatever the fuck this is mm-hmm. whatever the fuck is going on I don't know anyone else got some thoughts on on how this movie works <laughs> on how this movie is pieced together Mark well honestly when you were describing it it sounded like a decent idea it was the execution like that you were talking about it just didn't work at all and even like watching the whole thing I was like am I just really stupid? Like, I, I, am I just missing something huge that's going to make this all make sense? No. <laughs> you're, not, you're not stupid. The movie thinks it's brilliant. Yeah, yeah. That's the problem. Yeah. The, the movie is walking around with its big boy pants going, la da da I'm a smart boy. Yeah. And we're, we're just regular people who just want to watch, you know, a regular movie. You are, like, this This mo- movie constantly puts you at a state of disorientation because... On the, purpose. Because the, the dialogue is, like, very awkward and... And, like, doesn't really fit and the kind of changes, like, from which character says it to which. It does, like, as you were saying, reuse cast members. And the cinematography, you know, which... So unpleasant. So ugly. So. You know, I, I appreciate really creative transitions yeah. as much as the next guy. But when it's every goddamn transition and they're all, like, very jarring and disorienting and, like, they're full of creative flourish, I'll yeah. give them that. But it happens so fucking often that, like... When you're just like getting nauseous watching things scene to scene, and then when like a transition happens, like, Whoa, uh, okay, I, I guess we're here now. I guess like I wasn't following that character. There's like this one scene where um, it's Ryan Gosling and Hugh McGregor. They're just having a sit down conversation in his office, but the um, oh, what the hell is it called? Like the screen direction that the characters are talking to each other from each shot is them both looking towards the left. Whereas, like, if this were, like, shot like a traditional movie, you know, one guy would be facing the left, the other guy would be facing the right. So we know that these guys, these two people are having a conversation. But when they're all be- being shot at the same direction, I just start thinking, is this movie trying to tell me that they're the same person? Yeah. And, and, and it's my gay theory. And again, <laughs> and again, again like I, I, I was saying, they are kind of the same person. All of the people in this movie are all kind of Ryan Gosling. Yeah. Or they have been created by Ryan Gosling. Yeah. Th- there, is, there is puppets inhabiting the yeah. world, and he is their dying puppet master. Um, I'll tell you the most disappointing thing is that we, we see characters who are uh, playing multiple multiple roles. We're seeing, you know, like the, the background characters repeat over and over again. There are, there are characters who, uh, at the very end of the movie, 
um, show up and say lines of dialogue uh, to to Ryan Gosling's dying corpse that later mm. find their way into uh, his made up world. Uh, biggest disappointment. Uh, one of the many people who are uh, gathered around watching Ryan Gosling die in reality, nowhere do we see Amy Sedaris, who pops up mm. for one scene as a receptionist, mm. uh, talks about how, uh, I don't know who she's talking to on the phone, she just says, oh, you just gotta get drunk and do like yeah. tons of drugs, I love doing drugs, mm. I love getting drunk, it's fine. <laughs> it's yeah. clearly just Amy Sedaris yeah. Doing just like her uh, Amy Sedaris thing. Yeah, she's just doing like improv. Clearly, they just said like just riff Amy mm. or whatever. But she never comes back. Yeah, <laughs> she's never like a paramedic or anything mm. like that. They got Amy Sedaris for one day, <laughs> and then they forgot the concept of their movie was all the characters have to repeat. Yeah, yeah. and Amy was just all like, I have, a, I have an like, afternoon. I can oh, do this for like one. Oh, day. Amy Sedaris is in this movie. Great. Oh, she was in that and movie. She's, <laughs> she's gone now. Bye. Yeah. Um. All right. So. Now that we've revealed this, we can maybe talk about yeah. the characters. Just, yeah, as they I mean, are. like, just remember, audience, like, the reveal that this is all, like, right. taking place in a dream doesn't come until the end of the movie. So when we drop in to talk about, like, you know, he's just dying on the Brooklyn yeah. Bridge, just remember that's not shown to us until the very end of the movie. Yeah, so the two main people who are trying to save his life at the end are Ewan McGregor and then another random lady who is played by Naomi Watts. And mm-hmm. because they are, like, the two people who are, the, like, first on the scene, first on the scene, he has cast them as the lovers, essentially. So yeah, Naomi Watts plays Ewan McGregor's uh, artist girlfriend, mm. and she's an artist because we learn Ryan Gosling is also an artist. There's mm. lots of like carryover stuff, mm. uh, uh, and and she's also uh, suicidal. Uh, was suicidal. Was suicidal. But then she started dating her her psychiatrist, who was Ewan McGregor. And, yeah, that's and not it, a conflict of interest. That, he's created this very questionable backstory for right. these two people, like. Yeah, and he and she sort of serves as like a like a barometer for him to like bounce ideas off of because she <laughs> fascinating interestingly has uh, the same profession that uh, this uh, uh, new charge of his has, and also uh, he he is also suicidal. He is also stated in in what comes closest to a plot point mm-hmm. in this movie, uh, that he plans to kill himself uh, at midnight on his 21st birthday. Mm-hmm. And Ewan McGregor is now like, well, now that you've told me that, that's a big deal. There's I mean, a ticking clock element now. Now, yeah. now we gotta now, now we gotta get to the bottom of things, mm-hmm. Ryan Gosling. I can't let you kill yourself. Mm-hmm. And Ryan Gosling's like, whatever, man. Mm-hmm. I'm gonna go put a cigarette out on it. <laughs> you, you, you can't people can't see it at home, but Mark did a, <laughs> yeah. a hair whip. <laughs> He got the hair whip right. Yeah. Absolutely not. Uh, yeah. Yeah, so the movie is Ewan McGregor trying to save this wayward... He's not even a teen. He's, he's like... Troubled a, artist. Tr- troubled artist student or mm. whatever. Who idolizes another artist who, I'm just going to say, might have been just made up for the movie. Oh, they were fully made up. Okay, yeah. we, we're going to talk about this because <laughs> they they say that... They, but he, he idolizes like this one artist who did kill himself on, the, on his 21st birthday. Well, not only that... He killed himself on his twenty first birthday, but uh, he. Someone also mentions that uh, he burned all of his work, mm-hmm. and then later on, Naomi Watts is saying, "Well, that's his. That's his favorite artist. If he burned all of his work, mm-hmm. why is anyone talking about this? If there's no work, if there's no portfolio mm-hmm. for anyone to look at, <laughs> he couldn't possibly be anyone's famous artist because no art of his exists. Mm-hmm. There's a story there. There's like a, you know, there, there's like there's like a." a a yarn that gets passed mm. down within, like, the art community of, like, ah, oh, this was the, the greatest, legend of some guy, The greatest yeah. painter ever, but mm. you'll never know. Yeah. Uh, but it's like, you can't, can't be anyone's famous artist. But here's the thing about Stay, is that it's so jumbled and, and it, 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 you know, it spits in the face of, like, common sense and, like, regular, Continuity regular and... <laughs> story structure mm-hmm. that, like, an idea like that, like, nitpicking things in this movie is almost pointless. Mm-hmm. Because, like, at any point in time... Uh, someone could just say, "No, I'm a, I, I, I did that on purpose. Yeah, that was meant to be that way because yeah, yeah. Uh, the, that the was intentional. Power yeah. of myth, yeah, uh, et cetera, et cetera. You know, it's all it's, 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 it's an important, it's an impossible movie to criticize. Yeah, <laughs> uh, well, no, I, I think it's pretty possible to criticize. <laughs> I mean, that's what we're doing. Yeah, uh, but uh, yeah, but like you could just like, like I'm sure fans of this movie could throw back at us. Is all like, no, mm. that was intentional because yeah. 
Sartre says, or I don't know, some nonsense like that. Yeah, that this um, very unreliable narrative that you're, you're just trudging along all the way through. Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, that that was planned. I planned that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the whole thing feels like it was just lacking vision. Just, just any vision for what I want. Like even down to the shots, the separate shots. It's like I love cinematography that is trying something new, but every single one was like. Now this is just a bunch of choices. There's not actually a reason for you doing these things. You just want to, like, do weird things mm. to make us feel yeah. weird instead of having a reason that's grounded by story. I mean, I, <laughs> I mean like, this script is bonkers. It's mm. it's a nutso script that I don't know if anyone could have made sense out of it, but, mm. like, clearly the David Fincher version of this would have been a better movie, as evidenced by the, that list of movies that I, I, I named off, mm. that this guy, not a terrible director, he just doesn't have a singular vision. He just doesn't have the directorial eye that uh, that Fincher has for mm. something like this. Like, there's a, there, like one of the crazier camera tricks that this movie does is, uh, at one point, Ryan Gosling and Hugh McGregor are walking down a stairwell having a conversation, and then the camera briefly follows a, a third unrelated character as they walk into their apartment, yeah, and yeah. the camera pans over from them entering the apartment, closing the door behind him, and then the camera inside kind of creeps over to the window you know, like a documentary filmmaker following these guys continue their conversation down the stairwell and look i'll give i'll give i'll, I'll give the movie that i've never seen that in a movie before uh, gee i wonder why I don't maybe know. because it's fucking garbage i don't know if we needed to yeah. uh but uh yeah it's certainly something new and but like uh, that I haven't seen some, some of those are just like unique enough that you think like oh like Fuck, I, I bet I'm supposed to really follow this. Like, there's this one where they're having a conversation. Here's this, here's another fucking crazy camera trick they do. There's this moment where they're walking down a hallway and they pass by a column. Before they walk by it, Ryan Gosling is to the right of Ewan McGregor. Then they pass by it behind this column. By the time they walk out from behind the column, now Ewan McGregor is on the right of Ryan Gosling. Yeah. And it's like, fuck, they're the same person, right? No! And Wait, just, what? Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's just, you can just tell it's just the filmmakers just going, it's all Whatever, like, it's all a dream. Yeah, it's all, they, none of this matters anyway, so we can just get, like, really creative with, like, mm -hmm. the editing. We can have him appear over here when he was just here, like, a yeah. second ago. We can have him, like, be like, what's going on my head? We can have him, like, jump out of, like, the backseat of a cab, but we don't actually see him get out of the cab, but the next time we see him, he's already halfway up the driveway yeah. of, like, the place he's going inside. It's... It's mind bending and it's to an extent kind of cool. Like, we, if I were like a film school professor, I would probably give like some marks for creativity and, you know, the technical know how. But I'd also be like, tone it down a bit, I all right? You, I think you really hit on something there, Jameson. This feels very art schooly. Yeah. This feels, this feels like someone's like student film. Mm -hmm. more than anything else for like, sure yeah if this, if this year were in black and white, <laughs> like that, that would be, that would you be, you know what? It might be easier to stomach. The fact that it's, like, a studio movie with, like, big, recognizable blockbuster film stars in it, mm -hmm. maybe is doing it a bit of a disservice. If it if it just went, like, this is, like, a full experimental art thing, mm -hmm. I would maybe respect it a little bit more. But because it's from the writer of X-Men Origins, <laughs> it ended up where it ended up. Yeah. Okay, we gotta talk about some of the other yeah. actors. Like this. this movie has uh, like a Bob weird Hoskins stack. is in this fucking movie. Oh, uh, Bob Hoskins, <laughs> I miss him. Yeah, there's like a he was weird, great in it. Too. There's like a weird Pavlovian thing that happens in this movie. Like Bob Hoskins' opening scene within the context of, I guess, the story. Hoskins, the dream, is, or the or the, like this, the plot of the, the dream. Movie. Okay, yeah. Hoskins is playing, I guess, Ewan McGregor's mentor. He's playing like another psychiatrist mm -hmm. who is blind. Mm -hmm. Uh, and we meet them, uh, I guess, at their weekly chess game, mm -hmm. or whatever. Where he plays a, a game of chess against the blind guy. <laughs> which is a very cinematic thing. We see it happen all the time. Sure, yeah. Uh, he, you know, he's got the board up here in his mind. Mm -hmm, he's, mm -hmm. he's, he's eight steps ahead of you at yep. all point in time. And then uh, Ryan Gosling shows up. He wasn't invited. He just he just kind of shows up whenever he feels like it. Yeah. Uh, which is which is not a weird thing to happen in, in this movie. You just kind of accept it, and then uh, Ewan McGregor introduces Bob Hoskins as like his his colleague and friend, and Ryan Gosling freaks the fuck out, and he says, "That's my father. That's my father, and he's dead." Mm -hmm. uh, and we later learn in the real world that's that the case. Bob Hoskins was Ryan Gosling's father, mm -hmm. and he was in the accident, and he sure. died in the back. You know what they never established fully. Whether or not his father was blind. Hmm. 
And yeah. that feels like an important thing that you might want to establish in the reality segment of the movie, as mm. brief as it is. Yeah. He can't keep track of who he cast and what role, like what direction he gave him, but... Hey, just going back to my theory that when he's Ryan Gosling, he's gay, and his dad won't accept him as like as his gay son. Gonna, he just sees him as blind. You are gonna have, <laughs> you're gonna hammer this home until this is yes, true. sir. This is true. In my go. mind, it's a better movie. Stay. It, it is the definitive queer text of mm-hmm. the early two thousands. Mm-hmm. But he doesn't. He he doesn't recast anyone else in the car. No. As different people. His he, mom shows up, but he, she's still his mom. Mm-hmm. Even though he says that his parents are dead. Mm-hmm. But then other characters Ewan McGregor meets in the dream world that mm. say that they're alive. And then other people correct him and say, oh no, that lady actually is dead. So, and then his, so is someone lying to Ewan McGregor? Is Ewan McGregor losing his mind? But his father, Doesn't matter. But he's his not the main His father is dead, but he isn't dead, but he's this other person. Yeah. And he's blind, but was he blind in real life? Mm. I feel like that's important because, at, at jumping ahead, Ryan Gosling near the end of this movie will cure Bob Hoskins of his blindness. Mm. Why? So he can finally be accepted as his gay son. <laughs> He opened his eyes and saw the beautiful gay child in front of him. Mm-hmm. And he was like, I see you for the first time. Yeah, yeah. This is an insult. You're my son and I love you. This isn't insulting the blind people at all. <laughs> um, but I, I, got ahead, I, I got away from myself here. I, as I was saying, like, there's a weird sort of like ironic Pavlovian thing. <laughs> When Ryan Gosling sees Bob Hoskins, he freaks out and says, like, you're supposed to be dead. Mm. What are you doing? We're playing chess. What's the matter, Henry? You're dead. I want you to die. Sam, we'll finish this game later. Bob Hoskins is a beloved actor who's been dead for quite a while. So, like, when mm. we see him, it's all like, oh, yeah, it is. Yeah, you're supposed to, yeah. It has been a while since I've seen it. It's great to see you, buddy. Mm-hmm, How's mm-hmm. it going? <laughs> oh, I love you. I mm. miss him. Yeah. He's great. Yeah. Um, when did he die? Uh, like 2010? Maybe, maybe like a decade ago. His last movie was that um, Kristen Stewart, Chris Hemsworth, Snow White movie oh. where he plays one of the dwarves. Oh. Yeah, not a great one to go mm. out on. Uh, <laughs> super not good. At least it wasn't Stay. <laughs> um, can we talk about B.D. Wong? Sure. Uh, who the thing with BD Wan is he's 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 a great he's he's a great actor. Maybe BD Wan is gay because he's 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 the only openly gay actor in this movie. Um, mm. and it, but like the thing with BD Wan is I primarily know him from playing evil doctor roles, mm. and I don't know if he's supposed to be evil in this movie, but he reads as very evil, right? Because <laughs> he has like an evil goatee, mm-hmm. and BD Wan just has this way of delivering lines where it's like mm. it, he's the master of the veiled insult. He's the master of saying something to you that doesn't feel like he's insulting mm. you, but then you take a second, you go, hey, wait, hey, a-, wait a minute, mm. BD Wan. And he's got lots of lines like this, like, they break into Ryan Gosling's apartment. Yeah, which is like no furniture. It's got like maybe a mattress on the floor, and the walls are just like adorned with "Forgive me" scrawled into it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 But it's yeah. the most pretentious way you could have done that because yeah. it's, uh, it's like it's the movie, which yeah. is like the most pretentious way to do anything in this movie. When, when you hear like, "Oh, a crazy person wrote forgive me all over on the wall." There's an image of your head of what that looks like. What it actually is is like the tiniest handwriting yeah. that Ryan Gosling must have spent hours doing. Need um, magnifying he, glass. Except he did it because none of this is real or whatever. Um, and Perfect there's also... Cursive. Yeah. <laughs> over and over again. <laughs> yeah. Like, we can literally end every sentence with none of this is real or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Um, but, but like in the dream world, B.D. Wong plays like the head psychiatrist of a, of a mental institution that they cannot commit uh, Ryan Gosling's yeah. dreamland character to because like they can only hold him for so long and by the time he gets out, it'll be 1130 on the Saturday. But there's a moment where they play Ryan Gosling's answering machine and Ewan McGregor's voice is on the answering machine and he surprised by that he goes I didn't leave a message and BD Wong with the perfect acid tongue just goes like oh it's probably someone who sounds exactly like you Henry listen stay with me okay listen to my voice Henry stay with us is that your voice I didn't leave that message probably someone who sounds exactly like you 
<laughs> and again, I don't know how to take that in a movie like this where it keeps changing the rules of reality, but it's also just like BD Wan throwing some great shade. Yeah. I don't like I don't appreciate your tone, BD. <laughs> Reedy was just in the movie sarcastically. He was like, I know this is not going to be good, and I'm just going to take the paycheck and yeah. be sarcastic with every line. It's <laughs> a good gig. I, yeah. if, I, if I just hold out, eventually I'll be in a bunch more Jurassic Park movies <laughs> that aren't any good. Mm. Uh, yeah, the only other person we haven't talked about is Dr. Janine Garofalo, who is, who is the, the original psychiatrist. Yeah. That Gosling was seeing, mm -hmm. and she's having like a mental breakdown. Yeah, Ryan Gosling re envisions her as like a former psychiatrist who is just hopped up on pills and heroin, and like is probably suicidal is herself. She heroin? Uh, she's she's strung out on something, but and she, uh, and you know, you McGregor finds her in her apartment because she's been dodging his calls forever because he's trying to get some more info on this patient that she foisted on him. And uh, yeah, he says, "Okay, you can't go to sleep tonight because you're you got too much crap in your system or what have you." And uh, she tries to sleep with him, and I think that's the extent of her character in the dream world. Oh, does she? I'm worried about you. And I want to know more about Henry Latham. I didn't touch him. I know you're not supposed to move them. What does that mean? I want to kiss you. Do you want to play a kissing game? No, Beth. No, you're loyal. I, I was clearly in and out of this movie. I, I don't know. Mm. I don't really remember. But, yeah, uh, well, yeah. but I mean, yeah, she's also in it, and then like, and then like, she's the, oh yeah, because in the dream world, she keeps repeating the line. This is the first instance of of someone saying a line over and over again that doesn't make any sense, mm -hmm. and then we later find out that's like an actual thing that Ryan Gosling dying on the floor is hearing in the real world. Yeah, because she's like the first person that found his body, so she just keeps saying. I didn't move him, you're not supposed to move him. Mm. But, like, Dr. Janine Garofalo is also saying that. Yeah. And within that context, it doesn't make any sense, but she just keeps, like, repeating it like a mantra. Oh, fuck, you know what I just remembered? Mm. Um, th there's something, like, something stupid? Yeah, something real dumb. <laughs> <laughs> she, she, uh, she mentions when Ewan McGregor gets to apartment that he's watching us, and I'm led to believe that that's Ryan Gosling in this. And there's, like, this sprinkled idea that Ryan Gosling, in his state of just about to kill himself, can predict the future. Like, he correctly predicted that it was going yeah. to hail later that day, despite there not being a cloud in the sky, and it hailed. Which, what the fuck does that mean? I don't know. Within the context of a dying man, on the, why did it need to... I don't know. Yeah. None of the, I don't know. So, you know, know, Ewan, like, half thinks that this guy can predict the future, and he's also losing his mind, and he's, like, getting disoriented and getting caught in, like, you know, scene transitions. <laughs> <laughs> So he's losing his mind. He thinks uh, Ryan Gosling is to blame, yeah. and or is he's the culprit um, for it? He goes to he he tracks down uh, uh, Gosling's mom within the dream world, yeah. who yeah. multiple people have told him is dead. And then when he goes to like this abandoned house, he he finds her, and she's like clearly out of it clearly probably a ghost mm. and she has she's a ghost mom with a real dog because she has like an old dog and the dog <laughs> bites yeah. Ewan McGregor yeah, and of course when he goes to see Ryan Gosling he'd be like that dog died when I was 12 oh Whoa! spooky movie yeah. um I don't know I'm like <laughs> <laughs> and the mom thinks that Ewan McGregor is Ryan Gosling, and then and, her head starts bleeding. And we he, can literally just he, say the things that happen in this movie. He, <laughs> he starts playing along, and I'm just like, oh shit, so you are the same person. But when you're Ewan McGregor, you're the in the closet one, and that's why the mother can still see you. <laughs> <laughs> we're back. Uh, I mean, Christ, we're all this here. Um, oh, Ryan, Ryan Gosling tells him to go meet up with, um, uh, I guess, like an old, not even an old girlfriend of his, but a, a lady who worked at a diner that he had a crush on. Yeah, that character. Yeah. Fuck! Who, in the in the real world, not the dream world, was his actual wife who died in the car crash. But in this scenario, she's recast as like a diner waitress he barely that knows. That he only talked to once. Yeah. And then, yeah, and then she... Athena? Yeah, Athena. Athena. And then she is the actor... That Ewan McGregor goes to track down. Mm. Yeah. There's lots of Hamlet illusions. Uh, here's here's one of the IMDb trivia things that made me want to bang my head against a wall. <laughs> oh, I know um, what you're talking Ryan about. Ryan Gosling's character's name is Henry Lethem, which is an anagram of Hamlet. Now, <laughs> we're all somewhat learned people. <laughs> what the fuck does the plot of Hamlet have to do with with this particular story? It's not really about like someone. There's a, there's a someone, ghost. I mean, there's a ghost, but it's not really about 
about someone dying and then having their life flashing before their eyes. It does like a, go in. It does go into like the speak, uh, speak the speech, or um, like the play within like a play. The thing. players playing different players. It's a play within a play, but it's the play within his mind. Uh, yeah. You know yeah. what? This movie is brilliant. It's brilliant. <laughs> this movie is genius. We figured it out. Yeah, <laughs> it's um, a masterpiece. Did you did you appreciate <laughs> Sterling K. Brown's yeah. one? Yeah. His, his favorite word in the English oh language. God, I can't believe they kept this in. Mm -hmm. I can't believe they recorded this. All the garbage. And they kept that... this in. God damn. Uh, they're just, it's just, it's Athena and then the other actor played by Sterling K. Brown, they're just talking about their favorite lines in Hamlet. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to get the quote wrong, but he's all like, oh, my favorite line is like, My favorite line of the play is, Oh, what a rogue and peasant slave am I. I have no idea what any of it means, but I love the word slave. Hello. I love that word, slave. Mm -hmm. Well, goodbye, movie. Yeah. <laughs> I just walk out and it's all like, why did you have one of the only black actors say that? No. Nope. What, yeah. what, mm -hmm. what is that? What are you doing? Mm -hmm. What is the purpose of that? What kind of dream world are you concocting here, Ryan <laughs> Yeah, Gosling? right? What's what going on, What the fuck, Ryan dude? Gosling? That's like some some underhanded shit. That's, yeah. it's, it's like his, his, his thinly veiled racism. Yeah, like seeping. pouring through into his like his subconscious dying That's mind, the... and then pushing it back. So like, we don't have time to unpack that right now. You're yeah. dying. Yeah. You're... <laughs> oh god. Fuck. I mean, I mean, yeah. At this point, we can just talk about the the, the strange, goofy I mean, visual. We can just gadget. talk about the stuff. Uh, like, we we forgot to mention. I can't believe I. Can't there's believe. so many things. <laughs> we we, you know why? Because we probably spoiled it early. We jumped all over the place. Yeah. Uh, we forgot to mention that the scene uh, right after uh, Gosling cures uh, Hoskins' blindness, the son. These eyes start playing. Well, that, that's a that's a running motif. Guess who's these eyes is uh, is played in every recounting of the car crash scene. Yes. Oh, I didn't pick up on that. I just thought it was ironic that now that he can see, now all of a sudden these that eyes. song is what's played. Mm -hmm. I thought that was on the God. I didn't even God. You watch this movie better than I did. I, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm in like, definitely in and like, out of it. In like the last legs of my birthday weekend, when I was just exhausted. Yeah, I guess I paid a little bit more attention. And found the gay subtext. <laughs> that was clearly yes. Yeah. But I mean, it's just like a bunch of visual horseshit. Like, Hugh McGregor is following Athena down like a spiral staircase of a, you know, the tallest tower in the yeah. castle dungeon. And he falls down the staircase and he's fine. He, he keeps going to all these different restaurants trying to find where Athena works. And he finds a restaurant where a Athena works. He's never met this woman before. Why doesn't he just... Fuck it, whatever. I hate this movie. <laughs> <laughs> just trapped in time loop crap. Like. Yeah, I mean, I think we've and then he, uh, yeah, and then and then uh, Ewan McGregor within the dream world, I guess, figures out what's going on and he meets Dream Ryan Gosling on the bridge, and this is when reality is really starting to break, starting like, to break apart. down, and, and there's these like CGI strands of like light or whatever, mm -hmm. and it's all like. I guess in, like, a better composed movie, this might look interesting, but, like, I don't know, it just looks like shit's on the screen, I just wanted to get out of the way. Yeah, as reality's um, breaking down around and them. And then, yeah, and then, we, and then, much like Eminem, we snap back to reality, and <laughs> and Ryan Gosling is dying, and, and then we can see, you know, B.D. Wong was, like, a guy with a baseball cap, and Sterling K. Brown is there, and... And Amy Sedaris isn't there. Amy Sedaris had better things to do that day. But um, Ewan McGregor and Naomi Watts are trying to save his life. And Janine Garofalo is, like, yelling at the ambulance or whatever. Mm -hmm. And then Ryan Gosling dies. And Ewan McGregor and Naomi Watts go get coffee in real yeah, life. They, because that's what this was all yeah, about. Ryan Gosling playing matchmaker to these two uh, some, first responders. His dying subconscious brought these two random people together because they were together in his head. His, and his last dying thought, as he was bleeding from his head, was all like, they make a cute couple. <laughs> his, his last thought was uh, mistaking Naomi Watts for his fiance yes. and proposing to her because that's what Which he wanted sweet. to do. Which, there, yeah, was a, was, there was a there was a runner. There's a there's another that we completely forgot to mention. The wedding ring. That's like a whole thing. In the no, movie. We for, I don't forgot know. to mention the kid who said like, "Mommy, is that man gonna die?" And like the piano movers and shit. You know, no context. Like needed. The, forgot it. Forget the whole it. movie is like that uh, scene in the producers when he goes through that 
I'm I'm with Oh, there's Mama. She's on the porch. Alvin? Yeah. And then he's like, wait, that's not my life. Somebody else's life is flashing before my eyes. <laughs> that's great, Mom. That's, I mean, that's the best read on this movie. Yeah. Mm. He dies and someone else's life flashes before his eyes. That's what that's, happens. That's the and movie. it's not even a real person because he had to make it up because he doesn't know who this person is. Yeah. So he's created an entire identity for him mm. in the last final moments. Well, yeah. <laughs> was there anything else that we haven't discussed about this movie? Is there anything that we haven't talked about? Oh, I'm sure there's tons of shit we didn't talk about in this movie. But it's just, it, it's just a chore to get through. At one point, I'm going to have to look up exactly why I wrote this down. I wrote down mirror spot, which is a, a wrestling term. When an actor is, or a wrestler is supposed to be talking to themselves in a mirror, but it's clearly somebody else or a wrestler appears behind them and they turn around and they're not there. Right. It's just like dumb mirror tricks with um, that they do in professional wrestling. I bet you something like that happened in this movie, and I just don't remember exactly how. Um, the mom doesn't have any furniture in her house. Uh, oh yeah, something's going on there. He, he walks up to her house and she's already sitting on the porch and he doesn't recognize her. I mean, that was a fun, that's like one of those unintentionally funny edits where it's all like he knocks on the door and she's not sitting down on the thing. Mm. And then he looks back and she is sitting there and she's looking right at him and goes, I've been waiting for you. Mm. Uh, it's just kind of like the way that she says it. Um, I'm going to sprinkle some positivity on this movie. Please do. Yeah, just, someone's got just to. Just before we move on, because uh, we've been shitting on it a lot and that's fair. But, <laughs> but, but, uh, I love the architecture. I love the locations that they used for this movie. Mm -hmm. I, I enjoyed those. And when I got bored, I was looking at the building. <laughs> was looking at the building. Um, and number two, for it being so outrageous as a film, there was some decent connection between Gosling and Ewan McGregor in their scenes alone. Like when they actually just sat down and had a scene together mm -hmm. and decided to try and resemble a movie. Well, yeah, because it's, it's two good actors. Two good actors. You put two good actors in yeah. a room together with a yeah. bullshit script. They can give you yeah. some nuggets of gold. Yeah. They, I thought they, they, they did their job. Like they, you, you know, they brought it, and even like they weren't given much, and they brought it. And, like, yeah, <laughs> they, they caught each other mid scene transition. They didn't yeah. know what the fuck was going on, but they was like, you know what? Let's just. Let's just give this the old college try. Yeah. Uh, I'll say this. I thought uh, Ryan Gosling, for me not knowing what the hell was going on with his character, I thought he, was, he did the material justice. Yeah. Just, I don't think anyone gives a bad performance in this. I, I think true. they gave the performance that was given to them on the page. You know, actually, No one's embarrassing themselves. I wasn't completely sold on you McGregor's character, though. But well, only the subject of our podcast. Yeah. But yeah. Not, I'm not saying he's a terrible... I mean, the yeah. guy got through all, the, all three of those prequel trilogies and but had to read George Lucas' he was dialogue. He was asked <laughs> to play a character that doesn't <laughs> exist? Uh, fair. How does anyone do that? Yeah. Oh, so I'm the main character. No, you're not, actually. Uh, oh, okay. Uh, sure, let's give this a try. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> there's some gold here on the IMDb trivia page. There's a few things that I wanted to mention, just because there's a couple things that are interesting. Um, there's one thing here which I, I didn't notice, but like this is just like how like infuriatingly they must have <laughs> thought about this movie in terms of like how they were like staging things, because this is something I didn't even pick up on. Uh, in an interview with MTV.com, director Mark Forster reveals the reason why Ewan McGregor's trousers are too short for his legs oh. is because Henry's view of Sam is when he's crouching down and his trousers pull up when he does this. So I guess in every scene of the movie, Ewan McGregor is wearing trousers that are a little too small for him. Mm -hmm. And that's the reason, because someone along the way thought that hard about what's going on. Which gives you the impression that, like, no, maybe this movie is wicked smart, and we're just we're just a couple of dum-dums and we yeah, don't that's get it. It, <laughs> that's it was the trousers, Jameson! Mm -hmm. It was the trousers the entire well, time. Well, going by that line of thinking, shouldn't everyone's heads in this movie be massive? Especially <laughs> Naomi Watson and Ewan McGregor's. Yeah. <laughs> Their heads are bigger and their bodies are further away. Yeah, shouldn't Ryan Gosling's yeah. like, you know, proportions be like, oh, I'm like so handsome and Jack and uh, everything. And I just wanted, idealized version of himself. And I just wanted to read this one because I liked I liked the way that this was worded. This this is me reading this verbatim. The color yellow is used prominently throughout the film. It represents sunshine, happiness, loyalty, joy, optimism, remembrance, and warmth. It energizes mood and relieves depression. It's the lightest and brightest color on the color wheel. It's an attention getter. One reason taxi caps are painted yellow, and yes, I meant to say caps with a P. This is caps on IMDb. Are painted 
tinted yellow. Okay, all right. And in most countries, traffic lights and signs are yellow, meaning caution. Even some blind there, people. This goes on. Holy. Even some blind people can detect the color yellow. On the other hand, it represents cowardice and deceit. Judas is often depicted wearing yellow. <laughs> that's it. That's trivia. Uh, Thirty-nine out of forty-six found this interesting. <laughs> <laughs> That could be a fucking line from this movie. Jesus. Like, Some of the stuff that gets through these trivia well, things is Jesus. really wild. Well, thank you, Color Theory Corner. <laughs> that didn't have F- fucking, like, yellow doesn't like depict... It's a euphemism for cowardice. Yes. Yeah. Well, it's not I don't know. It's, only, it's, a, you're, yeah, it's a euphemism for all like these negative things. But also, like, all... Like, like 18 adjectives that mean the opposite of that. Also, this movie is more green than it is yellow. Yeah, what was yellow in this movie? I don't know. Apparently everything. Jesus. Apparently many things were yellow. Yeah. All right. Oh, fuck well, me. Well, <laughs> we have something a little special to do, but before we, we move on to that, uh, uh, I think I think we're going to have differing ideologies on this. Uh, Mark, Jameson, does this movie have a certain something, or is it just a whole lot of nothing? I think it's a whole lot of something, but not something good. <laughs> it, was the third. It, was, it, was, it was the third. Yeah, the, it was the, the ever elusive, the, rare third the, thing. Yes, the, yes, the ever elusive third thing, yeah. which is an option that we offer Sorry. sometimes. <laughs> no, that's fine. It's, yeah. it was, what, 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 what do you even say about this? You movie? know, it wasn't nothing. It was so much. That just didn't make sense. So it was a whole lot of something. You know what, Mark? You're right again. You're right on the money again. It was a whole lot of something. Mm-hmm. It's not that nothing happens in this movie. Too much happens in this yeah. movie is the yeah. problem. The problem is that you don't know exactly what it means. And then when every when like the veil is pulled up and you can like see what actually is going on, your reaction is just, oh, oh, okay. <laughs> but still, like now knowing that in the context, it just doesn't make for an entertaining movie. In no. fact, the only thing that I truly, really enjoyed in this were some of the you know transition camera cinematography tricks. And even I got sick of that after a while. Because it just becomes nauseating eventually. So, yeah. yeah, I'm not a fan of this. This is a not recommend from Jameson. No, no I'm, I'm, I'm not trying my recommendation behind this as well. I found this a laborious uh, film to watch. It's not a terribly long movie. It's no. about an hour and a half. But, Mercifully. Uh, it, but, like, you're going to want to go back and, like, double check to see if you saw some of those sight and it, things. And it feels <laughs> like there should be a longer... It's an hour and a half movie that feels like it was cut down from, like, a three-hour movie where, like, every side character got, like, a full expansive yeah. side plot mm-hmm. or whatever. Like, it really does feel like a lot of what Janine Garofalo did in this movie got cut out, because she's not really in it much. It felt like Bob Hoskins should have had maybe at least one more scene to kind of, like, mm-hmm. you know, establish the fact of whether or not he was blind or not. Yeah. Like, I don't know. Find out what happened to Amy Sedaris. <laughs> yeah. Just, just, you know what? Just more Sedaris in general. Mm-hmm. I'd, I'd be perfectly happy with that. Uh, but, uh, no, this movie is forgotten for a reason, Mm -hmm. because it's confusing, and it thinks it's smarter than me, and I'm not gonna gonna have any of that. I won't stand for it. I don't need that. I need movies to talk down to me. Mm -hmm. I need 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 Ant-Man 4, goddammit. I need things explained to me, yeah, like, clear, concise storylines. Sorry, uh, who, who the fuck is responsible for this? David Benio. Mark. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I call the guest, the guest choice month. Yeah. It's, it's, what, it's what it's called the guest blame month. Yeah. Blame, blame the guest. This this was the right. worst exploration of LGBTQ <laughs> experience I can imagine. Uh, Mark Dosla, thank you. Yeah. Thank you, thank for, you for both being a guest on this show and also for providing all of the equipment necessary to yeah. record. Yeah, <laughs> it really podcast. came through, yeah. Five years in, you think we would have figured Ta- this take out. Take note, other guests, you know. Like, <laughs> this bring, guy came through. Bring <laughs> your shit. Mm. <laughs> um, Mark, please take this opportunity to talk about anything exciting you got coming up, anything you want to tell people about. Big, big projects. The microphone is yours. Oh, yeah. Well, we have a proof of concept pilot that we have shot and is being sold or trying to be sold right now it's called public swim and i'm a supporting lead on that show so it would be great if it had a life of some sort so if this reaches anybody with either money <laughs> or connections no 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 right now no you you sound like you're on like a post apocalyptic radio broadcast. I'm setting this out to, to all of you. I mean, out there with money. Honestly, I'm hoping like 
that we can <laughs> look all back. all ships at sea. <laughs> it would be so cool if we could look back and be like, this is where I said it, and it turned began. into something, yeah. mm-hmm. and we made it. We well, were we'll, partly made yeah. it happen. Well, no spoilers, like, <laughs> but, but we, we are planning on getting one of your co-stars from that very same yeah. pilot and to be a guest on the show much, much later in the year. But So yeah. there'll, there'll be lots more public swim news. So tune into this podcast mm-hmm. where we're the official... Uh, number one public swim stands. A proof of concept that I've only seen a, a three minute trailer for. But hey, guess what? Good trailer. That's Perfect. all I've seen too. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you were there. I was you were there on the day. <laughs> yeah. Right. And you uh, you will be edited into uh, uh, Wonder Two. Uh, Wonder, uh, <laughs> yeah. Wonder Boy goes to Nazi Germany. Even if it's just what a, a weird fucking movie. I can't believe they they're made making that. <laughs> Even if it's just like a voiceover role. Yeah. A Ewan yeah. McGregor in uh, Rise of Skywalker. Uh, all right. Well, there we go. That was Stay. And it was directed by Mark Forster. And that was another episode of uh, Nothing Movies. More like Stay Away. Am I More right? More like Try to Stay the Fuck Awake. Uh, yep. If you like this episode, please <laughs> listen to more. We are on Spotify and YouTube. If you watch us on YouTube, there are all of these uh, wonderful uh, images that clips you can see. The clips, clips that you can see. Uh, unless you're Bob Hoskins and because he can't. Because he's them. dead. Because he's dead. He's dead in the ground, and I want him back. I want him back. Bring, bring him back. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're on all the social media. What are we on? We're on Facebook. Yeah. We're on Instagram. Yeah. We're on Twitter still. Yeah. Um, what's another one? Bumble. We on Bumble. Oh, <laughs> and uh, thank you to uh, Eddie Lamb for <laughs> her awesome theme we're music. Okay. Fantastic theme music. Next episode will be more guest stuff with an old familiar favorite, an old familiar guest. I'll I'll just love. Uh, rub my hands in anticipation for that. Who can it be? You'll have to check us out to to, to find out. But uh, until then, I'm Kaz. Uh, I'm Jameson. And um, may the force be with you. That's a line that Ian McGregor says in the whole movie. You don't want to end it with, I want you to stay. I want you to stay, stay, stay. No. I want you to stay. I want you to stay, stay.